in addition to the participants. Um, all right, so I believe Deb has our flag. Um, so we'll rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States. Oh, sorry, it's not even out yet. Deborah had to bail out because her image froze, so I had to move on the fly, Chair Adams. I apologize for the delay. Thank you. Uh, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United yeah, States of America so. and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, can we please have the roll call by the town clerk? I will do that as well. Deb's trying to lo load back on, so I'm going to... Okay, I thought I just wasn't seeing her picture, but she's not even here. Nope, she'll, she'll be joining us in a moment, hopefully. Councillor Devereaux? Here. Councillor Gabrielson? Here. Councillor Garvin? Here. Councillor Caitlin Jordan? Here. Councillor Penny Jordan? Here. Councillor Christopher Straw? Here. And Chair Valerie Adams? Here. Thank you. Yes, you're entirely welcome. Um, okay, so we now have an opportunity for citizens to raise items not on the agenda. If there's anyone in attendance this evening of our now 14 attendees, you'd like to raise an item not on the agenda, this is your opportunity. You have about three minutes per person and we ask that you please identify yourself by name and address for the record. And you may participate by using the raise hand function of Zoom meeting. Seeing no one, we'll move right along to our first item, item 102-2020, recommendation from the Energy Committee relating to a landfill solar project. Is there anyone from the public wishing to comment on this item? I see one hand. Again, you can comment by using the raise hand feature. Um, please do identify yourself by name and address. M Madam Chair, if, if not meaning to be, uh, interrupt, uh, do you want to do the uh, workshop portion first and then uh, and then do the council meeting after? Oh. And other items regarding the short-term rental ordinance and the uh, appointments committee recommendations that you may want to work on before you bring it back to the, uh, to the council for action. Right, I guess, yeah. I apologize for the, uh, if there's confusion there. Um, no, that probably makes sense. I guess I was kind of seeing these as sort of merged together that we, we would workshop when we reach the items, but it probably makes sense to workshop and then dive in. Um, I'm going to blame that. Blame it on the heat. It's I'll hot. take. I'll take the. I'll take the blame. <laughs> you can take the credit, Madam Chair. <laughs> okay. So, um, we will jump into the workshop. Um, and. Do we have a workshop agenda? There it is. Yes. I didn't pull that up. Thought I had seen that. Okay. So the short-term rental ordinance. Um, we can begin with that one. Um, I don't know. When we had discussed this at the last meeting. Um, there seemed to be a general consensus that people were not ready to send the version we had to the planning board. So I don't know specifically what the issues were that everyone had. Um, presumably there were some issues over the section F sub eight good neighbor conduct and um, and the fine. Um, so we'll kind of jump into those, but first an opportunity for public comment on this item. And I would note, um, we did receive a number of emails, so those were greatly appreciated for, from everyone who sent the emails. And um, I wasn't able to get back to everyone, but I would like people here to know that, you know, we do receive those emails and I absolutely read all of them and especially appreciated the work that a few of you put into compiling data, which is very helpful for us. Um, 
to do that. So it looks like we have Louise with a hand raised and talking is permitted. So you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, Louise, you may have to unmute yourself on your end. Sometimes it does take a minute, but you do have permission to talk from the host. Um, oh, yeah, there we go. go See, so you're unmuted now. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Uh, it sounds like you may have a bad connection. Hello. We, we can hear you faintly. Um, I don't know if Louise, if you can hear right now, if you maybe you want to try calling in on the phone. Is there any way to send a written message to Louise? Um, I, I think she may have just uh, jumped out and maybe trying to reattach uh, Madam okay. Chair. Okay. Um, so anyone else from the public wishing to comment on this item? Yes, Jessica. Jessica, you should be good to go. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I, I'm Jessica Sullivan, 441 Mitchell Road. And I just wanted to make a general comment regarding those short-term uh, rentals. I know there've been many meetings. I have, uh, I have not seen all of the minutes yet, but I would like to make a general statement, which is, um, <clears throat> I certainly am not in favor of what appear to be some kind of more draconian efforts to change the existing ordinance because I think that the uh, the purchase, the pending purchase or recommend, recommended purchase of software to track internet uh, rental activity with the internet seems to me would be certainly the way to go. I do have a short term rental. So uh, let me just put that out there. I do have one. And <clears throat> I think it would be valuable to get data for one or two years from the software before uh, any significant changes are made to the ex existing ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from the public wishing to comment on this item? Yes, Michael. Yeah. I'm Michael Howard, 15 Rocky Point Lane. Uh, re regarding data, are you, are you able to hear me? Yes. Good. Uh, I sent to the zoning, to the members of the zoning board uh, an email a couple of weeks ago um, that was informal data that uh, regarding Airbnb rentals and what I what I demonstrated was out of 39 rentals in Cape Elizabeth on uh, this was conducted during June 40% were showing available dates during June when the uh, moratorium was in effect the statewide moratorium was in effect uh, I suspect that a large that an additional large percentage was unavailable uh, because they were actually rented um, in addition, I, I demonstrated that 33% of the rentals are violating the existing ordinance regarding maximum number of renters per bedroom and the, uh, the current limit of eight renters uh, per house unless the lot exceeds 30,000 square feet. Um, I did not receive any response associated from, to that message and, uh, and that's okay, uh, but I have concerns about the enforcement mechanism uh, going forward. Uh, the proposed ordinance uh, indicates that uh, 
as I understand it, that, that people are supposed to be residents of Cape Elizabeth or at least residents of the state of Maine. Uh, based on my discussions with our code enforcement officer, my understanding is that that is based on the uh, filing of the homestead exemption. Uh, and, uh, and I'm wondering whether or not that's a strong enough mechanism. And in general, I'm wondering what is the appropriate mechanism for I personally don't feel that the existing ordinance is being enforced, and I don't know what the proper enforcement mechanism is, and I'm concerned about what the enforcement mechanism will be going forward. With that said, I'm in support of the existing, uh, of the proposed ordinance as written. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, anyone else? wishing to comment. Okay. Um, it does not appear so. We do have 23 attendees at this time. Um, no hands raised, so we will, oh, Louise. Louise made it back. Louise made it back. Um, Louise, talking is permitted. You can go ahead and unmute yourself. I'm going to try again. Can you hear me all right? We can hear you with connections a little better. bit shaky, but we can hear you better than last time. Thank you so much. Good evening, town council members, staff and audience. I'm Louise Davis of 51 Old Mill Road. Thank you for this opportunity to comment. I know you're proud of the opportunities made for the public to comment and you've said you read and listen. And Valerie, I'm very glad to hear that you mentioned that. I feel better. So I've taken the opportunity to write you three letters since January, made a public comment in June, and one tonight. I spent a lot of time researching possible solutions to the issue of problem renters and crafting my thoughts to be clear and reasonable and to the point and receive very little response and not sure that I've been heard. And in my letter of July 13th, I noted that some of your decisions appear arbitrary and lacking data, like the seven acre number. I'm not sure how you came up with that. And what if a house was abutting two other lots? Um, it seems arbitrary to me without data. It seems clear that you're listening to only a few complainants and not to the many citizens in support of reasonable and responsible STRs. I sent in my letter for the last meeting and yet what my understanding was one person stood up and made a comment about the number of STR nights being lowered and that a member of the council put on his brother's hat Louise, I think we have lost you. Um, if you can hear this, you can make a phone call um, and you may have a better connection and the information is in the agenda. Um, so we will take up your comment if you're able to, to come back and I hope that you are. Um, Penny? talking again. Hi, good evening. Um, I will pick up where Louise left off. Um, I think the point that she was making was that there was one caller who sounded really angry. And I think that that has been uh, kind of a hallmark of those who the, the complaint, uh, the people who are registering their complaints is that they sound really angry. And I feel like they get a lot of attention for that. And I feel like the, those of us who have been saying over and over again, hey, you know, we've been doing a good job here. We're not hurting anyone. No one's complaining about us. 
uh, why is it that, you know, Jeremy heard one uh, person at the last meeting say, wow, you know, I think you should reconsider that number of days. And Jeremy said, yeah, let's, let's have another meeting. Let's have another workshop. Let's talk about changing that number again. You guys did a lot of work on coming up with those numbers. I thought it sounded all really responsible and reasoned and, uh, you know, an arduous process. And then, you know, you get one angry phone call and you go back to the drawing board with this. And, you know, I, you've heard me say it before, I just wish that, you know, as was mentioned with the prior caller, um, that there were, if there had been a mechanism for enforcing the original ordinance, which was a really good ordinance, you guys, it was very good, then we wouldn't be here today because the people who complained were complaining about people violating that original ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jessica has a hand raised for the second time, but I'd like to just make sure there isn't anyone else who hasn't spoken first before coming back to her. Okay, uh, I don't see anyone, so go ahead, Jessica. Uh, thank you. Do you need my address again or anything? No. Okay. Um, I just was interesting uh, listening to uh, Penny Call's comments. As some of you may recall, I was on the ordinance committee when we wrote this original short-term rental ordinance, the first ever for Cape Elizabeth. We do have we do have enforcement procedures in place. It seems from what I followed, the issue is not being able to track rentals that are are existing that are not registered within the with the town. And I think the uh, proposal for software to track these in order to help code, code enforcement is, is excellent. Um, and I think that once that is, you know, in force and we have extra personnel if needed to respond to what the internet uh, data tracking tells the town, um, then, then this can be dealt with. But there are so many of us that have short-term rentals that have no problems whatsoever are in full compliance with the existing ordinance. So I, I really uh, think that gathering important data is the first important step before you make any changes to what I think, frankly, is a very good ordinance that ex exists now. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. It does not appear we have any other hands raised um, among the, oh, we now do. Penny, did you have a response that you wanted to? I, I can wait till, I can wait till everybody has uh, spoken, that's fine. Thanks, Alan. Okay. Um, Michael Howard. I just want to respond to the statement by the, uh, by the previous person who said that uh, that there are good enforcement mechanisms in place, my experience is that um, that when violations, when I find violations, for example, sh multiple rentals within a seven-day period, if I contact the code enforcement officer, he says that I need to contact the police, and if I contact the police, then they say that I need to contact the code enforcement officer. So if there is a clear uh, enforcement mechanism in place for the existing code, then it, it is not clear to me what, what that is. Uh, and that is kind of, that is the only concern I have about the proposed ordinance, which is uh, regarding, um, regarding state of Maine residency and the filing of a homestead exemption. It just isn't clear to me what the, what the mechanism is going to be. And honestly, I don't have confidence that there's going to be any way for that actually to be enforced without individuals uh, calling the main Department of Revenue and uh, trying to report someone who's filed a false filing. I'm done. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. 
Um, I don't see any other hands raised. So at this point, we will close the public comment period. Um, and um, Penny and Jamie, I'm assuming that you, you two have some responses to those comments. So Penny, go ahead and then Jamie. Okay. Um, and I apologize for any noise in the background, but it seems to be a pretty busy town tonight from a siren perspective. Um, I just want to say, and, and I don't want people to take this as uh, being um, defensive in any way, but um, I, I strongly feel that what um, I strive to do as the chair of the ordinance committee was to create one an extremely um, engaged and inclusive uh, dialogue around the subject of short-term rentals. And I also want to say that um, there is nothing arbitrary about what uh, we had put forth. When we talk about the seven acres or greater, we um, gathered data around the uh, number of lots that would fall within that that range and um, use that as kind of the uh, template for um, how we might craft that part of the ordinance. When it comes to abutting and adjacent, what we try to do is listen to the different models that exist around short short-term rentals and test them to see if there could be a way to craft them in a way that limited the um, impact on um, neighborhoods, neighbors, and, um, and the community. When we talk about, um, was it the people who spoke the loudest that uh, were the ones that um, um, had the most input into this uh, ordinance? I can emphatically say no, because we created one of the, I truly believe one of the most inclusive um, to the point where Maureen was going penny three or four hour meetings, my God. But it was about hearing everybody's voice as we crafted this. And, um, and for people who have short term rentals that are generational, it breaks my heart. Um, it isn't where I wanted the ordinance to end up, but it's where we had to um, place the ordinance was what is it that we can use as the highest decision making criteria and then go from there. And the highest decision making criteria had to do with uh, primary residents. Um, and I think that you have all read the ordinance and you see how that cascades down through uh, the whole ordinance. So I just want to stress that it was about inclusion. It was about hearing the different models that exist around short-term rentals. It was about coming up with how we have the least amount of impact on neighborhoods. And when you look at the objective of the ordinance, you read that it is about peace and tranquility within neighborhoods and limiting um, businesses that can uh, impact that. Um, and, and so I just need to stress that I do not see anything arbitrary about what we did. Um, and I feel that this ordinance puts forth the best solution that we can come up with that will have the least amount of impact on neighborhoods and recognizes the rural aspects of Cape Elizabeth as well. So there's a balance that we tried to strike. Thanks, Penny. Um, Jamie? Thanks, Valerie. I just wanted to directly um, address Mr. Howard's comments first, um, which have to do with the um, uh, the, the criteria, the threshold that somebody um, somebody's property to be defined as a primary residence. 
would have to meet the meet the criteria of being eligible for or having already um, filed for the main homestead exemption. Um, so um, that is something that if if demonstrated that they already have filed for it um, is a, a strong proof of primary residency. If somehow somebody has chosen to um, lie or deceive in trying to attain that um, um, that qualification, um, that's a felony under Maine statute. So we felt that that was a very strong, um, uh, you know, very strong way uh, to ensure that um, be, you know because of that potential. Um, uh, violation uh, were, were they to be uh, not effectively presenting them their property um, as eligible uh, that that would that would have strong enforcement capabilities so um, there were there were other criteria that were considered for that that were actually deemed you know easier um, to sort of skirt around uh, than than that requirement so um, I just wanted to specifically respond to that. Um, generally speaking, um, just in, in broad response to some of the collective comments, I, I, I echo what Penny said. Um, I, I take issue with, and, and, and I am sort of disappointed that the impression amongst tonight's audience is that um, only those that have spoken loudest are the ones that are heard. Um, we have worked painstakingly on this over a many number of months um, with an effort to um, come up with something that that truly, you know, in my opinion, works to thread a needle and create uh, and forge a compromise on a very complex and and, and complicated issue, um, and um, you know, take everybody's input and individual situations into account and try and um, you know, try and have those be equally considered um, in creating the output that's you know before us for consideration now. Um, the other thing I, I wanted to say is that um, I think uh, understanding that there has been an ordinance in place um, and that ours was actually one of the first in the area, um, a lot has changed since that ordinance originally went into effect. Um, and I think it's appropriate for us to be trying to keep up with um, the times and the changing marketplace as it relates to short-term rentals. Um, people have questioned us about you know, different data points and I, I think raised some very good questions. And for some of the questions that we have been posed to us, I'm not aware that we have the data or the information um, to provide back to them. Um, but some data that we have used and that I've leaned on is that, um, you know, over the last couple of years, uh, on just one of the rental platforms alone on Airbnb, rental activity has increased fourfold um, in just a couple of years. And there's no sign that that is going to decrease or plateau or level off in any way. Um, so this is a, a, a burgeoning and expanding marketplace um, that if we remain um, complacent about, um, the activity is, is surely going to far outpace um, our ability to regulate it. Um, the other thing um, that I've been trying to keep in mind as a, as a driving sort of focus and, and um, um, sort of balance to strike here is that the work that we've been doing has been by its design intended to react to um, and respond to specific known issues with the current ordinance and complaints that we've received um, from people within the community um, about the negative activity that's happening related to short-term rentals in their neighborhoods, while also trying to be proactive in, like I just said, um, sort of responding to the marketplace, anticipating where it's gonna go and to the best degree possible future-proofing um, our regulations so that um, you know this activity can continue but in a well-regulated and um, uh, you know respectful uh, manner so um, it w when I hear comments that oh well th there you know there haven't been any complaints at my place or things like that that very well is, is true and 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 I'm glad that that's the case but it doesn't necessarily mean that there won't be issues in the future, not necessarily at, at your individual property, but just generally um, with the expanding um, activity in this market. So um, that's the balance that we've been trying to strike. Um, we've you know, been trying to give um, 
you know, give a degree of priority to uh, Cape Elizabeth residents uh, for a way to have an auxiliary and supplemental use of their primary residence. Um, and, and the idea behind that has been that it will have a positive impact on, uh, from a number of standpoints, from, from both um, reducing absentee landlords um, to uh, having people that have more skin in the game as it relates to the rental activity happening at their properties um, to effectively, you know, reducing the number of homestay nights um, overall and, and reducing the activity overall. So um, that has been, as Penny said, sort of at, at fr from the from the beginning, uh, the threshold that we um, started to work from and everything else has sort of built off of that. If, if, if we were to go in a different direction. Um, you know, there's other ways that we, we could certainly structure an ordinance. That was the way the ordinance committee um, determined, you know, was the way to be most responsive to the entire community's needs. Um, there will definitely be some people that, you know, that uh, if this sort of passed, then that, that compromise um, is disadvantageous to them. And like Penny, I, I, um, you know, empathize with, with some of those situations, um, but I think the, the greater good is achieved um, through what we've come up with here. Um, the, uh, the last thing I would just say contextually is that if you look around at some of our neighboring communities, some other communities in the United States, um, even as, as written and drafted here today, this would remain among the more liberal uh, uh, ordinances in place as, as far as short-term regulation uh, rental regulations go. Um, you have to look no further than South Portland where you see that um, the type of activity that we're, we're looking to permit and regulate here um, would largely not be permissible there where um, for the most part uh, an unhosted uh, rental is not allowed in any uh, residential zone. Um, so you know there there are far more strict regulations that are out there, um, you know, some of which, you know, folks on the ordinance committee and others on this council have advocated for. And what we've tried to do here is very, I, I think, elegantly and delicately try and strike a balance between a lot of competing um, needs and wants and desires. And, and I hope we've achieved that through what we've come up with. Chris, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so as usual, Jamie makes a number of very good points. Um, he and I often disagree on a number of various issues, but it's often in how we weigh the various factors um, as if I'm in disagree what the actual factors are. So one of the things that uh, he and Penny noted uh, that I just want to um, uh, also um, highlight is with respect to um, public input, there, was a, there has been a very good amount of uh, public input on this. And um, I think Penny did a wonderful job of really allowing a, a lot of public comment continuously to the point where uh, we occasionally had debates going on uh, during these public comment periods because uh, we, we were allowing a lot of, uh, all, we we're being very flexible with the public input rules. Uh, but as to the, the most vocal people kind of uh, getting their way, I think it's the exact opposite. I think the most vocal people would say this is exactly contrary to what they would want um, I think most of them, as we've seen from the various emails and correspondences over the last few weeks, would say that the idea of unhosted rentals more than two or three weeks um, is not what they would support, not to put words in their mouth, but that's my guess. Uh, so I don't think that this reflects the viewpoint of the most vocal people. I think it represents the viewpoint of, um, of uh, <laughs> basically the people that want to allow to continue, allow this commercial activity to continue, continue in residential zones. So. Uh, I, I wouldn't agree with that. I, and I don't think the word arbitrary is the right um, uh, adjective or, uh, for the term. I think what it's more is it's uh, unsound would be my viewpoint as I think everyone already knows. I think the, the logic and rationale underlying the ordinance is somewhat unsound um, it, it, and it's not very well grounded. Again, that's just my viewpoint when I look at the factors. I don't think that this is supported by the comprehensive plan. I think it's contrary to the comprehensive plan. And for that reason, I won't be supporting it. Um, but with respect to the, I do want to highlight one aspect of this before our discussion really gets going here. And it's something that Penny said, and taking a step back and looking at all of this just from a 5,000 foot perspective, 
objectively. It's, 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 uh, I find it intellectually curious because she was 100% spot on. Um, and I was like, yeah, whatever. And she has, and Penny, I apologize if I in any way mischaracterize what you said, please correct me. She made the observation, the, the 180 odd days for unhosted in this ordinance, uh, the ordinance committee, I, I didn't support any of these numbers. And I said, as one of the three members of the ordinance committee, whatever you guys want, uh, cause I'm not gonna hold this up. We need to just send this to the town council, get more, more view. Uh, so it was really, it came from Penny and Jamie and the numbers, uh, my understanding, and Penny, correct me if I'm wrong, is it's we're going to put place over and hold her numbers in here. And she made the observation that she was concerned that we, if we don't address the numbers sooner rather than later, uh, she made the observation that these things tend to uh, crystallize and freeze in place. Even though it was meant, and I apologize if you guys disagree with me, but my understanding is it was meant as a placeholder. But we have, in fact, crystallized around these numbers, which is quite interesting. Uh, why are we stuck with these numbers when, and I apologize, Jamie, if you disagree with me, when they, in effect, um, reflect what Jamie's consensus was of what the numbers should be. So it, it, and I, I voted along with it to get out the committee. And I, my understanding was Penny viewed it as a placeholder. Again, correct me if I'm wrong as to your viewpoint. But it does reflect one counselor's viewpoint as opposed to something we deliberated in great detail. But we've nevertheless, interestingly, uh, much to my surprise, have uh, really crystallized around these numbers. So I would ask us to all, and Penny and Jamie, if I got any of that wrong, please correct me. But I'd ask us to remember that when we're looking at these numbers, when we're trying to decide, are these the numbers we want? Valerie, uh, sorry, Penny, did you have a direct response? Valerie, do you have a direct response to that? First? I do, I do okay. actually. I'm, I'm not a member of the ordinance committee, but I attended um, a lot of the meetings, which, um, as everyone said, were amazingly well attended. We had so many residents there. There was so much discussion that uh, it was very impressive because the committee had one idea, they'd listen, they'd move, they, they were flexible. I, I was really impressed. But I wanna say um, in response to what Chris was just saying about the days, Penny did say, uh, she didn't want a day, a certain amount of days in there so that it would look like that's stuck. But I don't think that's what happened because at first people were looking at 30 days, then 90 days for unhosted. Then, um, then, then it moved to, well, um, if you're a primary resident, you, why couldn't you have 180 days or 182 days unhosted? because then you'd still be a primary resident. Um, and so it was that for quite a while. And then we had a workshop where we talked about reducing it and we reduced it to 90 days. Um, then we had another workshop and we changed it to 105 days to make it equal weeks. So I think that um, the number has not been crystallized. We've really massaged it and worked with it and I think that, as Jamie said, we've really tried to strike a balance here. I don't think it's one counselor's desire over anyone else. It's more of um, numbers that we all came to at our last couple workshops. Penny, go ahead. Okay, this is in um, direct response to Chris. Um, Chris, you articulated that perfectly because that was one of my concerns as we moved it out of our committee to the uh, town council was that things become uh, fixed. And I'm not saying that, um, I'm not saying anything about that these were Jamie's ideas. I'm just saying that we did keep having placeholders and we said, let's send it to the council. That's where we will have the dialogue around this. And that's another reason why when Jeremy said the other night that, yeah, maybe we should workshop this one more time. To me, I saw that as the opportunity for us to delve into those numbers and, and, um, and crystallize them a bit more because it's traveled through the bureaucracy and it's, going to stay that way until we step back and we say does this make sense relative to a neighborhood does this make sense relative more rural part of our town so 
you um, you were spot on, Chris. Um, on that note, Penny, <laughs> um, I had envisioned that the first thing we would talk about this evening was the numbers. So, <laughs> um, could we just get, I, I don't know if people have in their minds kind of other numbers um, or if we just needed to have more of a discussion around the current numbers. Um, so can I just have a quick show of hands um, who's satisfied with the current numbers? Jamie, Caitlin, and Valerie, Deborah. Okay. Um, so Penny, would you like to, uh, Jamie? Sure. Do you have a comment before we start? Well, I, yeah, I just, I, oh. I just, I wanted to just uh, reiterate a comment that I had made in our meeting last week, um, which which has to do with, you know, many of these components and elements of the ordinance working together collectively and, and um, you know, not necessarily individually. And so, yes, I, I understand people thinking that a certain number of days is a very high threshold. And, you know, ultimately I'm not averse to, to coming up with something lower, but what I am also focused on is the practical reality that for very many people, who their primary residence is the property that they will be potentially operating as a short-term rental and an unhosted one. Um, it's not, you know, it's, it's not very common for many of those people that they're going to be renting it out for that long. And, and particularly from the input we heard, you know, from, from operators at our meetings, um, you know, when we asked people and polled people, well, how long do you typically, you know, the, the, the range was all over the place, but it was, you know, anywhere between probably about 30 to 90 days. Um, you know, there were some that were at the far end of it, others that were at the lower end, um, but it was somewhere within that window. Um, but I think, uh, uh, you know, as a starting point, just the mere fact that what we're discussing is that it will have to be your primary residence. For the vast majority of the people, that's a much lower number that they're going to be functionally and effectively renting out the property. Are there some that will take full advantage? I have no doubt that there are. Um, I, I think, you know, for me, one of the think one of, one of my thoughts on addressing this was if, if we're sort of taking something away, you know, is there something maybe not of, of sort of equal value, but you know, some degree of flexibility that can be created for folks on, on the other side of that. Um, so that's sort of how I, you know, came to this. Do, do I think all of the unhosted rentals are going to be for 105 days in town? I think the exact opposite. But um, anyway, so whether or not it's actually 105 or something lower, I I can be flexible on that. But that's I just wanted to contextualize my thinking and my approach to to coming to that number, and and particularly in light of you know, some of the emails we've gotten as well as other um, comments here tonight about things being arbitrary, that was my rationale. So it, you know, people can disagree with the rationale or not, but it, that, that was how I was approaching it. Uh, thanks, Jamie. Um, so on the number of days, um, I, do you mind if I put you in the spotlight, Penny? I was hoping. No, not at all. No. Start the discussion. Um, um, I I want to say that as I um, uh, read uh, the emails that uh, we received, and I I do want to stress to people that I re read every single one of them um, because short term rentals has been my life for I think the last year. Um, and and I think it's a very uh, critical issue that, and we live in a town that uh, provides us the citizens provide us with data, and I and I love it that uh, the amount of work that went into it. Um, I do agree that with the uh, hosted um, that I still agree that to the no 
uh, limit as to the number of days. I, I, I support that. Um, I do want to say that as I thought about uh, the input that people were sending, and I thought about our objectives and about um, peace and tranquility in neighborhoods, and that um, how do you how do you make sure or try to ensure that you're um, creating the least amount of opportunity to create a um, um, to create challenges within the neighborhood. Um, and so I think that the more days we have that um, are open to uh, short-term rentals for the unhosted, the greater the opportunity is for there to be um, some sort of uh, issue or challenges. So I started, and I appreciated the fact that the data was sent, um, I started looking at, you know, the uh, the four weeks or the three and a half weeks or um, something along those lines because it goes back to the other thing that um, as we were putting this together was um, uh, allowing people an opportunity to leverage their asset, which is their house, in order to um, uh, help defray their taxes. Um, and so, um, as I looked at those numbers, I think people put forth some um, really um, good uh, information about what uh, what are those number of days. So I I stepped back and I started looking at the um, uh, the four weeks. So um, and then I started looking at for um, the seven acres or greater that are non-primary and um, and the um, unhosted uh, that because they aren't um, immersed in a, a neighborhood and it um, it is I I considered that this could be a place where we're looking at um, potentially uh, three months that range. Uh, so that would be greater. And then I started thinking about how do we, how do we manage that? Because if people, when they're applying for their uh, permit, they need to say whether they're hosted or unhosted. Um, and I would assume that that criteria gets put into the, um, um, the software, the utility that we use in order to um, monitor short-term rentals. And so uh, we would have criteria around each of these short-term rental models that would be uh, put into their um, system and would be able to manage them accordingly. So I say unlimited, then uh, it can be, you know, four weeks, it can be 30 days, it's something in that range. Um, and um, and then for the um, unhosted greater than seven acre non-primary residents that it would be a, a greater number of days because they aren't sitting in um, a neighborhood. So something in the three month range. That's what I would throw out there. Um, Penny, do you mind just to organize all my documents here. Do you mind just running through your categories and numbers quickly again? So I can jot them down. Sure, sure, sure. We have the first one, which is the uh, primary residence hosted. And I still support that that could be um, not limited. I mean, the people are there. Right? It, it, it is what it is. Um, I think that can work. The uh, primary residence unhosted. I think that um, as I, I looked at the data that was given, it's like uh, 30 days seems to be a reasonable amount of time to help uh, meet the objective around defraying taxes, which is one of the things we talked about. Uh, the uh, seven, greater than seven acres, um, non-primary residents and um, unhosted, that we could be in the um, in the three month range for that. 
And that also, also include, includes the uh, a button. And that's, uh, yeah. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Jeremy, I'm going to call on you next because I see you nodding along. Um, are you largely in agreement with the numbers that Penny just set forth? Um, I, I think that sounds more in line with what I was thinking. Yes, I, um, you know, I, I appreciate Jamie's observation that with the higher numbers that we were envisioning, relatively few properties are probably going to hit those maximums. Uh, I, I understand that 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 makes sense to me. I think. Um, the, yeah, I was think I, I didn't have a specific number in mind for any of them. I support the idea of of not having a cap on the hosted rentals. I think something in that thirty range um, for the primary residences makes sense to me. And I, I also um, support the idea of having a, a higher cap for the seven acre plus properties. Just as Penny noted, because the the, the impact on the neighbors is likely to be significantly less. So yes, in general, that, that sounds more in line with, with what I was thinking. I think it would also be consistent with the, um, many of the comments we, that we've received. Um, and I, the, I guess the other factor that I'm still trying to think about and weigh in with this is uh, based on our following our meeting last week where we discussed what the actual fees are going to look like. Um, the, I just, I, I want to make sure that we, I guess one concern I have with a 30 day rental cap and a $500 annual fee is that when you start to take into account the other expenses of operating a short term rental in terms of a cleaning service and whatnot, I wonder if we're actually allowing enough room for people who are relying on that as a way to help defray some of their tax expenses to make enough money for the activity to be, to be worthwhile. Um, so just paying attention to that interplay between the fees and the other aspects of the ordinance. Um, I, I thank you for the, the many folks who've written in with their, com with their analysis on, you know, how much people are charging and how that relates to, to property taxes. I think that's very useful additional data um, to have for this discussion. Um, but I, I just want, I, so I guess I, I could support a slightly higher number than 30, um, but um, I, it, yes, in general, it's in line with my mind. Valerie? Um, I, I too want to thank everyone who sent us all of the emails and gave us all the projections on taxes. But I'd also like to say that with the pandemic going on, I have a feeling that there are going to be some people that need to rent out their place, not just to pay taxes. There's a lot of people out of work. There may be people that um, need that help for more than just paying taxes. Um, and I feel that it's, it's doesn't really, um, it's not really clear when you say seven acres unhosted is two months, but then if it's seven acres, hosted, it would only be four weeks. So I think we need to make it just seven acres, correct? Because you're saying hosted would be, an, oh, because it's a non, it's a primary res, it's a non-primary residence. They can only have it unhosted for, oh, all right. So that would be, two months or eight weeks. It just seems that if we made it eight weeks across the board, it would be easier to, um, to enforce that way. And Maureen, maybe you can um, speak to this. How difficult is it going to be to enforce if we have some of the unhosted for four weeks and some of them for eight weeks? Is that going to create a problem? Is it all right? Do you want me to answer? Okay. Um, Chair Adams. So I, I don't do the enforcement. The co-enforcement officer does. And I know he's present at this meeting. 
uh, but we've talked about it and not putting words in his mouth. Uh, honestly, the shorter amount of period that people are renting, the easier the enforcement will be because it's the renting next to people who are expecting peaceful, quiet, and enjoyment that's creating the friction point. So I think if the choice is to have an across the board number for all the different types of short term rentals that's higher than if you were going to lower some of those numbers, he would prefer a lower amount of rental days. And he's here now. Um, ben, if there's anything you'd like to add to that, please feel free to jump in. It, it is the less categories is easier, although with the way we're setting up the new software, we should be able to follow those relatively clearly with those defined categories, but also what, what Maureen said is accurate. Chris? Uh, yeah, so um, th this is moving in the direction of more reasonable uh, in my mind, just my opinion. Um, two weeks, I think, would be the more reasonable for unhosted. Uh, it balances the various demands people have. I still think it it's not what I would want. I don't think it's uh, necessarily justified, but two weeks seems more reasonable uh, and meets the, the, the property tax arguments that people have noted. It, two to three weeks will cover most people's, prop, a good number of people's property taxes in town. Um, and to Jeremy's point, uh, one approach that we could adopt to deal with the fee, the fee issue would be to have a lower fee of like $50. And for that $50, you get to rent for only two weeks and you have to designate those two weeks ahead of time as part of your application process. Uh, that makes enforcement, I would imagine, very easy because if everyone on their ad has to list their, uh, their permit number, uh, the permit number would be tied directly to an exact two weeks that they're permitted to be advertising. And if they're advertising anything other than those two weeks, and we give that to whoever the vendor is, they presumably would be able to very quickly identify it. So that'd be a way we could address the issue that uh, Jeremy uh, raised, which would basically be have another category uh, that says two weeks, uh, cheaper permit, you designate the two weeks as part of the permit process. Um, and I did want to touch on that seven acres aspect. Uh, and uh, I understand the concerns some have raised that it seems kind of just like this, this arbitrary number that we've chosen. Uh, but for me, uh, the rationale underlying it is the fact that for at least just my personal view, uh, our zoning ordinance is messed up. And one of the things we need to do uh, there, there are many things that need to be fixed in that zoning ordinance, but one of the things we should have done is, as part of the comp plan is we should have created new uh, districts in town. And the problem is we have these massive, massive districts that encompass uh, areas of town that are very, very, very different. And we're trying to apply this blanket approach to these very different areas of town. And the seven acres is an attempt to, it's kind of a poor man's attempt to, uh, uh, to treat certain types of properties within one massive district uh, differently. At least that's what my view of, uh, was not in an arbitrary and capricious way, but as kind of a, a shorthand attempt to identify the properties where they're not near their neighbors, where, where the, uh, the visitors coming, where um, they're making noise and there's no one there monitoring them 24 seven with skin in the game, game, there's less of a probability that it is having an adverse impact on the abutters. So I think that at least from my, that was my, understanding of what the rationale was for the seven acres and why it's in there. And yes, I agree, it would be better if we simply had more uh, detailed uh, districts that were a little different, but we don't have that and we're working with what we do have. Jamie? Thanks. Um, I think um, what concerns me about reducing the number of days so greatly and even further restricting and regulating in the way that Chris just suggested with having to pre-designate weeks and all that kind of stuff is that we're then potentially setting up a pretty extensive and complicated infrastructure system for tracking and managing and regulating this for what will ultimately wind up being a very very small amount of activity and to be quite frank I think I could be much more easily swayed to just eliminating unhosted rentals altogether um, versus trying to come up with this very complicated set of boxes that you need to check um, for what I think will really be, a, a, you know, a complete fraction of the activity. And to me, question, I, I, I question 
why there's any value and, and what, what makes it worthwhile to even set it up in that way to begin with. So um, I, I think I, I, I agree with both Maureen and Ben's comments about trying to keep things as simple as possible. We've heard that consistently from, from them throughout the ordinance development process. Um, we've heard that that they've relayed that to us from folks like host compliance that that you know the simpler that you keep these things the easily more easily regulated and monitored and enforced that they are um so um anyway that's this my response and, and reaction to that um at some point too and it, I, we don't have to i don't want to take us away from the discussion of the dates but um uh valerie i, I do want to register a point it's in response to the email that Maureen forwarded to us from Ben about concerns around enforcement and and so on and so forth. So again, don't want to don't want to take us on a tangent from where we are right now on the on the days allowable discussion. But if I could just sort of pre-register that as something else I want to discuss on this. So, are you referring to section F sub eight good neighbor conduct? Yeah. So Deb Deb Lane had forwarded us all the email that Ben sent through Maureen um, like a week or so ago, or two, almost two weeks ago now, so. Yeah, I have that sort of slotted next, so. Okay. We'll get there. Thanks. Um, okay, uh, Jeremy, yes. Go ahead. Thank you. I just wanted to ask Jamie a follow-up question. Um, so when you say that shorter time period, are you referring to the two week time period that Chris was talking about or were you referring to the numbers that you mentioned? Um, well, I, I think generally, if I, if I may, Valerie, generally um, just the further we reduce it, the less active, you know, we're, we're really driving down, I think, the, the number of potential amount of activity. And I just start to question the cost benefit of you know, so whether it's 30, 14, 14 with pre-designated week, I mean, you know, you work your way down this funnel and all of a sudden there's hardly any activity and we've, you know, structured a very complicated ordinance for something that, in my opinion, my prediction won't really exist that much anymore. Um, uh, a question I did want to ask, um, for folks that are gravitating down towards a lower number in the vicinity of 30 days, 28 days, whatever, that is, um, I don't know if anybody, I, I was thinking of this earlier today in anticipation of this being an evolving majority opinion um, of the group. And I don't know if anybody has any thoughts because we didn't really talk about it much when we were talking about such higher numbers to begin with in the ordinance committee meetings, but at a lower total cap, if anybody has any opinion on changing um, the current seven day um, cycle period. So currently, you know, you can, you can, ha so at, at 28 days or 30 days roughly, you would basically only be able to have four bookings. Um, so what, and if you're charging on a per night basis, um, you know, that might not be the full seven nights. So um, I, I think I can come around to a much lower number. I, I, I'm not in agreement, but I, I, it, I think I could come around to, and I think it would, it would at least go some way to, again, achieving that balance that I've been so focused on if we then altered um, the requirement that it be a, a full seven day rent cycle. I don't, and I don't know if that, I, not having really thought this through very much, but I don't, I don't know if I would be in favor of just eliminating it altogether and you could rent single nights and have 30 people rent over 30 nights or have it be a two or three night minimum. I, I understand the purpose of the seven days is to limit the turnover. Um, I think when we, if, if we wind up going so far in the direction of limiting, limiting the total number of nights, again, on the, on the, on the concept of some give and take and, and flexibility of compromise, I, I would be interested in opening that up for discussion. Penny? Yeah, I I didn't think about it in those terms, Jamie, but I did think about, and maybe you guys can help me, I did think about the fact that it's not, um, 
when I talk days, I'm not talking um, uh, consecutive, I guess, because you could have somebody rent for uh, three days, one week, and uh, then a couple weeks later, somebody rents for four. I think it's cumulative. I don't know if that makes sense, but that's kind of what I thought about. Uh, Valerie? Well, I remember the committee talking quite a bit about this, and we were talking about um, keeping it at one week so that you didn't have a lot of turnover during the week. So I could see where somebody has one week in June, one week in July, one week in August, maybe something like that is not cumulative. But once you start going to days, then why not just have it for 90 days rather than turnovers every day because it's the same thing. It's all that turnover is what people are having problem, one of the problems. But the other thing that um, I believe it was Jamie brought up at one of the previous meetings is that we're, we're reducing the number of rentals by making it primary residence. And right now, a lot of the problems are from non-primary owners, residents that are not primary. So it just seems that we're, um, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, uh, make this so restrictive on people that aren't really causing problems. And my guess is there are people out there that two weeks renting um, is not going to pay their taxes especially once you pay a fee, you pay the cleaning people. My, even with the spreadsheets we were given, some of those spreadsheets said three and a half weeks, four weeks, depending on the home and depending on what people charge, two weeks, I don't know that would even cover taxes. So um, it just seems that making, if you're gonna say seven acres unhosted two months, why not just say all unhosted two months or eight weeks? And that way, um, it's uniform. And the other thing I wanted to point out is when we talked about the seven acres, a lot of that, um, my understanding was um, the Sprague property with the camps out there. No, it's not. Okay. All right. So this is different properties. That's then only that's only part of it. There's number of properties, other properties that are greater than seven acres that um, do have short-term rentals. And so, um, and there's, uh, we had some scenarios around a budding property and we had, so there's a number of scenarios out there and um, um, much of the, the, when you look at the um, properties that meet the criteria of greater than seven acres, um, it is about, and Chris alluded to it, it's about properties that are outside of neighborhoods. And it, it really represents more of the, the rural aspects of Cape Elizabeth. So that was kind of the logic around it. Jamie? Um, I just wanted to ask either Maureen, I think Maureen, you're the best suited to answer this, but on, on Penny's interpretation of those days, I, I guess I'm not clear. Um, I had thought that whether you rent for a day or you rent for seven days, it counts as seven days. And that seven days, whether you had somebody in it or not, counts towards your rental threshold. Is that is that accurate? Yes. Say that again? Uh, yes. So when the ordinance was originally adopted in 2012, one of the main complaints was the churn in the neighborhood. So the right. ordinance was written for a minimum seven-day stay. And what we have discovered with the current ordinance is there are some people who have um, found ways to interpret the language so that it's it necessarily seven days. 
and uh, some of the bitterest complaints we've received has been about the people who are moving in and out of properties in less than seven days. So the current draft, we feel like we've closed as many of those loopholes that we can imagine by making it explicitly clear that um, you can have one rental per seven days and if someone only stays for three or four days, say they, they come for a long holiday weekend, you still have locked up your property for seven days. Did that answer your question? Um, yeah, it, it does. Um, and so I think, I think the interpretation that I understand is that that 30 days isn't spread out individually then, right? Um, you can, we had during this current process, had a conversation at one point about the 30 days would have to be consecutive uh, to track and that right in the draft and then it was gone so right now when you if you say 30 days the idea would be that you would be able to rent your property for seven day blocks four different times of your choosing and just so we're clear i know people are getting really you know concerned about 30 is not evenly divided by seven you know just because you say 30 days and it has to be a seven day block Someone could rent their property for a 10 day block. So you've got seven, 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 and 10. Right. Um, okay, does that answer your question? I think so. Jenny, did you have something to add to that? I just, um, I'm just looking at the brain trust here on this screen and um, because I think we're coming to, we're closing in on something that could be uh, uh, logical and we just need to figure out, and I'll look at uh, Jamie, Valerie, and Jeremy, and Chris, and Caitlin, I can't see anymore. So um, what logically makes sense to, um, if one, wants to reduce the number of days from 105 to a number of days that meets the requirements that we have kind of been talking about, which is we want to help people defray their uh, taxes. We don't want them to have, have to, within that, um, absorb all of the expenses that might be associated with the long-term rental fees, et cetera. So we want them to consider that. And Valerie uh, Devereaux had an interesting point that um, there are going to be um, some other challenges that, that people might have uh, as a result of um, uh, COVID, et cetera. Not that I wanna to delve too much over there, but I think we're honing in on that we have a set of requirements and that we could come up with a, um, a number of days or a number of weeks that logically makes sense based on that criteria. And I think, Jamie, you kind of started alluding to it around, okay, we got this seven day thing. And I had thought about it from a different direction, but had um, erroneously uh, thought about the seven in incorrect way. Uh, but what do you guys think? I mean, there's a number that makes sense based on what we put forward. And I just can't wrap my head around it. Chris? Uh, I don't subscribe to this rationale, but to attempt to answer your question under perhaps the rationale you want to subscribe to. <laughs> um, I think what I would ask if I was approaching it, I think from the way you're approaching it would be, do I want this program to uh, allow people to pay the entirety of their taxes or a portion of their taxes? If I'm looking to, uh, if I say it's fair to allow them to pay a portion of their taxes, I would hew towards the two weeks. Uh, if I'm saying I want them, I want to be sure most people will be able to pay the entirety of their taxes, I would hew towards uh, four weeks. And I'd, I'd settle on that 30 day number. If I'm saying I want them to be able to not only pay their taxes, but use this as a way to make a living, then I'd be going for a higher number. And it, that's the, the approach I would take. Um, and I think it sounds like we have a general consensus that 
four weeks should be enough for most all, most people at the rates people are looking at to cover their taxes even with the fees. Um, so if you say 30, which is a little more than four weeks, that seems like a pretty fair number if that's the rationale and the goal that you're proceeding under. But I could be wrong. I'm curious if anyone else has a different view. Um, I agree with you, Chris. I'm not going to vote for the ordinance regardless for other reasons, but um, in terms of the 30 days, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, Jeremy? Yeah, and I guess I, just to add on to that, I, I appreciate the the thought that people have put into looking at this in terms of how the, the rental income relates to people's property taxes. The fact of the matter is, if you're renting out your home as a short-term rental, it's your income, you can do with it as, as you want. And so um, that, that's one factor that I'm thinking about. The other is just coming back to this idea of the short-term rental as an accessory use to the primary use for the property, which is as a primary residence. And, you know, I think that something in that, in that 30 to 50 day range is, is well within the span of what I would consider to be an accessory use. I know there's some folks who are going to say, well, that's still the whole summer if it's at 50 days. Um, every week is going to be rented out with turnover, and I'm sensitive to that too. But um, so I, I, I think I, I think you know th that's the range that I'm looking at is is in that 30 to 50 day range, and I can I could see myself you know being fully supportive of any number that fell in that range. Caitlin, yeah, I was going to say I was in the same time range. I was thinking more 45 days and making sure that it's clear that it's not consecutive. Like you can do 45 days throughout the year at any point. So we talked about that a ways back, I raised my hand, but then we moved on, but it doesn't matter. I just want, my understanding was that it was gonna be non-consecutive 45 days or whatever number we land on. But I'm with you, Jeremy, in that same time frame. I'm comfortable going anywhere between 30 and 50. I mean, doesn't that technically mean that someone could go out of town every weekend for 45 weekends of the year and that property could be turned over all of those times, which I understand is not going to be the majority of cases and there may only be a few properties that do this, but I do in fact know of more than one individual who has done something like that, gone away many weekends and rented the property out. 45 days you would think a weekend would be three days. So that only gives them 15 weekends to do that. Well, unless they do two nights and you know, it could end up being a lot of weekends. Out of the it year. could end up being 22, but it's not going to be 45. Um, Jamie? I thought, we, I thought we just said though, that if they rent for a two or three night weekend, it counts as seven days. It does. So that I, unless I'm misinterpreting that, unless I'm not understanding that correctly, I don't think what you're both supposing is a hypothetical is accurate. Right Correct. now, that might be happening because there is no limit. But, but as a practical matter moving forward, I, I don't. I, I think that's what Maureen just spoke to as the, as part of closing that loophole. So if I'm if I'm misunderstanding that, I'm happy to be set correct on it, but I don't think that that's either how the language reads or what the intent is either. So, Maureen, do you just could you just clarify? I'm looking at the ordinance, but it's okay. not. And, and I mean, we have to make a distinction between what the ordinance says now, what the proposed ordinance says, and what you want it to say. Because in the end you could depart from the way it is right now and you could depart from the proposal. But the way the ordinance is written right now, every short-term rental stay is supposed to be no less than seven days. And unfortunately, some- folks, Every booking, Maureen, not, not, every, not necessarily, yeah, every, you know, somebody could book, you know, somebody that could be considered a, a booking window and maybe that's the language we should be using here. For a but, minimum of 
seven days. We, we can't lock people in a house for seven days. So they could stay for three or four days and then the house needs to stay empty for the remaining week. Um, and then on day seven, you can rent it again. And the, the proposed ordinance sticks with that theme, writes it even more strongly, includes uh, the casual family members, friends are going to visit, which we are getting complaints about now. Um, and so if you stick with that seven days um, and you say, and the other thing is we are not with the big caps, like the 30 days or the 105 days, there is nothing that says those have to be one week after another. If you have 105 days, that's about 15 weeks. I think that's what you figured out. The assumption would be if someone is going to maximize their revenue is they're going to rent for three months in the summer and then they're going to pick up three holidays and they'll get their 15 weeks. So they don't have to be consecutive weeks, but there needs to be a booking of seven days. Okay. Um, there are a bunch of hands up. Um, Valerie and then Chris jump right in. Um, that was my understanding also. And if we talk about 45 days, that's only six weeks. So if somebody rented it out for a weekend, that would be six weekends um, in the year because that counts for seven days if they only stay for three days. So that's only six weeks, 45 days. I think that sounds very reasonable. Um, and I would agree to that. It looks like Valerie had to step away. Matt. I think Great, we can have a free for all. I think, that's, I think that's accurate. Uh, her video and uh, audio, just when uh, she may have to attend to something at home. Uh, Councillor Garvin, uh, oh, here's Valerie's back. Sorry, <laughs> Sorry. I, thought, I thought that I said that, but I think I was muted. I said I have to step away for a minute so Chris could jump right in. Uh, I, I just wanted to point out, uh, or I just wanted to note something that uh, Jeremy noted about uh, bringing back in the discussion about accessory use. Um, and it's a little tongue in cheek, but uh, if an accessory use is a use that's incidental and subordinate to the principal use, um, for me, that would imply that it's a use that's occurring when the other use is also present. Uh, so if one were to say that this, that we're looking at this as an accessory use to the principal use of it being a residential use, that residential use should be happening when the accessory use is occurring, which would, for me, indicate that we should really be looking at not allowing unhosted stays. So if we're looking at this as an accessory use for me, that cues, uh, causes us to lean towards um, uh, Jamie's point, if we're gonna make this so complex, why don't we just only, <laughs> only allow hosted stays? Because I, I was persuaded during our various discussions and whatnot that the hosted, as people have known, the, it's the unhosted stays that are causing almost all of the problems that we're hearing. If that's the case, why are we allowing these things if we can make this so simple by simply eliminating them and allow the hosted stays to continue relatively unrestricted. Okay, sorry about that, thank you. Um, Penny has a hand up next. I was going to, um, I guess it's uh, similar to Valerie Devereaux, but uh, I was going to, go to the six weeks, the uh, 40, 42 days, which um, I think can be sufficient for um, unhosted um, um, primary resident rent, short term rental. And so I was going to go in that realm of the uh, six weeks, 42 days. And it's in, it's in, like Jamie says, and Maureen, and it's in, a uh, seven week block. So you block, uh, once somebody rents, that block is taken, whether it's three days or five days or one day. It sounds like 
there may be some consensus around the six weeks-ish time period. So can I, clar can I clarify? Because the, I'm not talking about the seven acres or greater. Right, right. Just okay. in terms of the, the primary unhosted, I just want to sort of tick these off as we go and see if we can move through them. Um, so could I just have a quick show of hands as to who would support, I mean, it seems like 45 days has been the number that most people have thrown out. Um, so Penny, Jeremy, Valerie, and Caitlin. Okay. Um, Jamie, did you have another comment on that? Particular I did. Topic? I did because um, Maureen um, made a passing reference to something that I had meant to bring up as a point and had completely forgotten about. And as we went along through the ordinance committee meetings and we added in fairly late in the game, the point that she just referenced around all stay types, whether they're actual rentals or friends and family or what have you, all being bundled into the category and definition of, of the um, the use and, and being a rental, even if there was no transaction, even if it legitimately was friends and family that you were loaning the house to or, or just having them come by. And I've always been uncomfortable with that. Um, I understand its intent and purpose because I know that people are using that as a, as a workaround right now. Um, however, I, I philosophically disagree, particularly with family, but um, also with, with you know, people who are close friends or what have you, um, with somebody's inability to say, here, come and use my property. Um, when there's, there's no financial transaction happening, it's not, it has nothing to do with business at all when that's legitimately happening. I, I was slightly um, accepting of its inclusion based on the higher threshold such that, well, if for two weeks, I have my, you know, in-laws and nieces and nephews come and use the house. And yes, that'll count against my total allotment of, of available booking days, but, but I've still got enough other income generating days, um, then, you know, I have no concern. You know, I have less concern about that. I, 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 I don't know that I, I, I you know, I, I, think, I think we definitely need to revisit Understanding the, the problems that it causes, I think we definitely need to revisit that if, um, if we're considering non-income earning days as part of that total allotment. Um, I, there are some hands up that I, Valerie, did you have a response to Jamie? I, I'm just going to say I completely agree and uh, I don't think that it's our place to tell people that they can't have friends and family for three months visiting them. So I think we, we have to change that. That just doesn't seem um, like something that we are setting out to, um, to enforce. Uh, it just it doesn't seem right to me. Caitlin, did you have a comment on that specifically? Yeah, I was going to say, Jamie, thank you for bringing that up because I totally agree as well. I, I forgot about why I was going with such a high number to begin with, but that's correct. I think we need to definitely look at that because you can't tell people that they can't have their family come visit because they've maxed out their six weeks. I'm not on board with that. Um, when I looked at that um, again this afternoon, um, one of the things I thought about is that the decision that's being made when somebody um, decides to do short-term rental is they are, um, they are running a business. 
And I know it sounds harsh, um, but um, when you get your permit and you put your house out there and you start uh, offering for a short-term rental, you've made a decision about how your property is going to be used. And um, my heart says that that's too bad that the, fam the, the family is going to count against those days. Um, but the fact is one's making a choice of how they're going to use their property. Um, so uh, I, I, I don't have the need to remove that at this point in time, even with 42 days. Chris? I just wanted to note that having your family come for visit three, for three months, and I asked the code enforcement officer and uh, the town planner to weigh in on this, uh, doesn't in any way implic implicate any aspect of the short-term rental ordinance because they're there for more than 30 days. So they're not in the world of short-term rentals. So I think this is a red herring. Uh, to the extent that we're instead talking about having family come and visit for a week or whatnot, if you're there on the premises, um, that's a hosted short-term rental. And we can get into the, oh, if you have to pick one category or the other, that aspect of things. But I think Penny's point that if you've gone the route of saying, I'm gonna be doing unhosted short-term rentals, uh, then yeah, uh, <laughs> these are businesses and that, that's just a cost you're going to incur in that you've chosen to go down that route of basically commoditizing your, na your neighbor's uh, peaceful, quiet neighborhood. And if so, I don't feel sorry for you that you then can't have your family come and stay when you're already inflicting this on your neighbors. Uh, if you go down that route, you, you reap what you sow. Um, but again, if you're just having family come and visit for extended periods of time, for more than 30 days, they're not even in, the, in this realm. But you guys have also highlighted a fundamental flaw in all of this, and that one, and I'd be curious if the code enforcement officer and the town, and the town planner can weigh on this. Uh, if you do have people coming to visit, uh, even if it's hosted, do you have to get a permit? If, I, if my extended family come and visit, they're technically, are they tenants? Uh, do I need a permit? Do I have to pay $500 to have friends come and visit even if I'm there and it's hosted? Um, it's a curious question with respect to how this is drafted. Obviously, we wouldn't intend that, but I'm curious what the language said. Maureen or Ben, just jump in with a response. Maureen says Ben. <laughs> I, I wouldn't consider family visiting a house as a as a short term rental. I think that if it's your primary residence, uh, friends and family can visit you, and that's completely unrelated to short term rental. Even if it's um, if the primary resident is not in residence, so it's just the family at the house. No, that that would be different if the family is not present. But if you, uh, if, if you are having family come visit you while you're in the house, uh, I mean, that's a, that's a single family use that has nothing to do with short-term rental. If, if you're allowing friends and family to use your house for a week when you're not there, uh, then that appears as a short-term rental. Matt, did you have something to add? If I, if I may, Madam Chair, I know, uh, the last summer, it was consistently uh, raised as an issue and as a red flag where it was in many ways being employed as a way to work around the uh, the current ordinance. Uh, oh, these guys are my family. But it's awful hard to go and prove uh, you know, consanguinity or, uh, or fam family relationships that go through there. Uh, and that's that's a burden that's awfully tough on the code enforcement officer to then prove where someone may find that they have shelter in order to uh, work around the rules. So that's kind of why this had had to come up because it was consistently and flagrantly being violated last year. Uh, we just didn't have the authority to be able to uh, pursue it in that fashion. Jamie? I was just going to respond to Penny and Chris's points about, you know, Penny, you were saying, hey, you're, you're entering into a business and so on and so forth. Um, I think the key difference here, again, comes back to the whole notion of the changing dynamic and definition of the activity, whereby we're reorienting it to it being your primary residence. And Chris, I'll use the word supplemental use instead of accessory use. 
um, if that if that is more satisfactory. But um, it's uh, in that case, you know, if if I'm um, you know, if I'm going to be away and my in-laws who live, you know, in central Maine um, want to come in and use my house for the week so that they can, you know, have access to the beach and stuff like that. I think that's a, a very different proposition than, um, than generating income from property. And, and so I, I just philosophically disagree with that. Valerie? I, um, I understand, Matt, how this got put in and why, um, but I have to agree with um, Jamie that philosophically it's not right. The other thing that I think what you're gonna have happen is that there's gonna be people without permits that have family come for a week, come for two weeks, and maybe the next month they have another family member come for two weeks. So now they have to go get a, a short-term rental permit or they get turned in by someone that they're renting it out. Um, it just seems like you're going to create more problems because now you're going to have people that don't have permits that are going to have family staying. So how are you going to police that knowing that, oh, this is a, it's actually uh, a short-term rental that doesn't have a permit, or is it somebody who really is just having family come and stay? It, it just seems like it's gonna create more problems. Um, go ahead. I, don't, I don't think it needs to operate that way. If, if someone is not operating their house as a short-term rental, I do think that a friend or family could stay at their house. It's when someone chooses to become a short-term rental and make income from their property that will be strictly regulating their property and turnover on their property. So if, if, someone, choo if someone chooses not to get a permit and not to make any income on their property and they allow friends and family to stay, uh, we would not be enforcing the short-term rental ordinance on them. That's my view of it at this point. Just a quick question for Maureen, our excellent drafter. Um, is that the way the proposed ordinance reads? Now, if I understand what Ben said, um, if you have a short-term rental permit, um, anytime anybody is using your property, it's counted towards your number of short-term rental days. And that's what you're agreeing to that, Ben. Yes. So, I mean, I understand folks are uncomfortable with this and I'm sorry you're uncomfortable. Uh, and I would ask you to remember that um, for people who are living next to a short-term rental property, uh, it doesn't really matter to them whether the person moving in and out and running up and down the street is related to the owner or is a stranger who's paying for a week. And you know, your struggle is you're trying to balance all these different competing desires. Ben, did you have something else to add? Yeah, well, Maureen, the, the question was, if someone is not a short-term renter and someone chooses to stay at their house for a few days, does that require them to get a short-term rental permit? And does the short-term rental ordinance apply to someone who no. does no short-term rental? Absolutely not. If you're not, if, if you are not in the short-term rental business, if you're not enrolling in an online platform and trying to rent to people, and you're just someone who likes to have family from out of state visit, you don't have a permit on file, you're never even gonna come across the code officer's radar, which is a very busy radar. I take his calls. Um, it's only if you are actually running a short-term rental and either you got a permit or you're running one and someone makes a complaint and our third party software says, well, it appears that you are renting out property, your property to other people, then it's going to get triggered. Is that correct, Ben? 
Yes. Okay, Jamie, go ahead. I think we, if, I, I agree with that as a, as a definition. I think we, we either need to tighten up or further specify in, in what we have as a definition in this draft ordinance, what short-term rental is then, because the very vague clause of the first sentence, otherwise making available for transient occupancy, has nothing to do with presupposing that the person is a registered um, operator of a short-term rental. That that's a pretty open-ended and, and open for interpretation um, clause that suggests that well, if I'm making it available to friend or family, whether I have decided to be a registered short-term rental operator or not, then by this definition, that activity is defined that way. So I, I think we're all on the same page on intent. I think the language might not exactly reflect that. Maureen. Uh, that in the end, it's going to be up to the code enforcement officer. And if he receives a complaint, uh, he's going to call Mr. and Mrs. Jones, and they're going to say, our sons were up for the week, and these are their names. And he'll have to make a determination on whether he's going to pursue enforcement. And I think he's going to be able to figure out when someone is hosting a family and when someone is um, trying to repeatedly rent their property without getting necessary permits. But the problem, if, if, you, if you take out the language that says, or otherwise, um, that is the loophole that we, we have people using now. Um, based on that, um, I think it was Jamie, Valerie, and Caitlin who had concerns about that. Um, where do you stand on the 42 or 45 days. Just trying to see if we can get, you know, I, I know I'm not voting in favor of the ordinance, Chris is not. So I just wanna see where there is and is not consensus um, on that number for the primary unhosted. Valerie? Um, I guess I would go, go along with it for the, for the six weeks. It just seems um, really severe for somebody who's having a hosted rental, but I understand the reason for putting it in. Um, I would um, I would go with that, but I would also agree to um, increasing it by a couple of weeks. I don't know. I guess I would just go with it. Caitlin, what's your position? I was nodding along with you. I mean, I would agree with it. I mean, in even adding a couple of weeks, six weeks to rent it, a couple of weeks to have family come, but. At the same point, I hear Penny's point that if you're choosing to rent it and make a business out of it, then you give up the right to have your family come up and use that time. So I hear both sides. So I'm, I'm good. We can move along. Um, so that would be a majority in support of... Jeremy, where are you at right now? Um, I'm still fine with the, I, I'm fine with it based on the explanation that we've heard. And, and I would also just note, you give up the right to have your family come up when you're not there. I don't, I, I tend to stick around when my family comes to visit, but maybe I'm odd that way. Okay, so we have a majority for, I, there were two numbers thrown out. There was 45 days, which is not, does not break down into sevens. And then there was 42. I think the majority of people had favored 45 days over the 42. So Penny, you have your hand up. 
No, I'll let you finish. Never mind. Um, so just a quick show of hands on the 45 days for primary unhosted. Was it that people were saying six weeks and not 45 days? Can I, that's, was it six weeks that people were saying? I, both were thrown out, so. It's 42 days, right? Yeah. Do we, sounds like we prefer seven. So, okay, so six weeks, quick show of hands, please. Um, so Penny, Valerie, Caitlin, Jeremy, Amy gave a non-committal wave, but I think he doesn't generally support that as being a good sport for the sake of moving along. Um, okay, so other than Penny bringing up 90 days for uh, the seven plus acres and abutting, and Valerie mentioning eight weeks across the board, um, I didn't get a sense that most people were uncomfortable with the other numbers. Um, if someone else is, please do jump in, but um, let's just do a quick show of hands for seven plus acres and abutting unchanged as, as are written out in the proposed ordinance. Oops, I was muted, sorry. Um, so that's, that's everyone except um, Chris and myself. Okay, so I think that we have resolved that, yes, Maureen and Penny are both waving. Um, Penny and then Maureen. Did we, I'm sorry, I sometimes I lose my place. Did we resolve Jamie's question around the definition of short-term rental? Because I thought he had a question, which I thought was very uh, um, uh, meaningful, because the um, otherwise making available for did we resolve that that the definition stays as is? So, my understanding was that this last question, people in favor of the the six weeks, was even even that as is in the proposed ordinance. Okay. Does that change your point of view? You were muted, Penny. I just wanted to know it was resolved, if people think it was resolved. Does, if anyone does, did not intend that, please raise your hand now. Okay, um, Maureen. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to make this difficult for you, but under the seven acres plus, it was, it, it has applied to both primary residents and non-primary residents, and it keeps going back and forth depending on how many days you um, assign to primary residents unhosted. And as long as seven acres is gonna have 182 days, I think you need to say that the seven acres is gonna to apply to people who it is primary residents and non-primary residents. Cause right now it just says non-primary residents. So I'm going to assume with some of the nods that everyone's okay with me making that change. I think that was the intention. Great, thank you. Okay, so, um, the, hang on, I will be, I'm just gonna close the door. <laughs> okay. Um, so, we have a consensus on the number of days, unless anyone else wants to bring something up. The next item, um, which Jamie had referred to was the email about enforcement um, from Ben, which included both the 
Section F sub eight, good neighbor conduct, and also the fine issue. Um, so Jamie, do you just, now that we have Ben right here, um, did you wanna pose a question specifically or start that discussion? I'm happy to. Um, so Ben, I really appreciate your input on this. I know how difficult this is both in terms of what you deal with currently and what we're looking at on a proposed basis as well. Um, I think that as you've probably seen from following um, along with all of the work of the committee and the discussions council level, um, this has been the hardest thing for us to try and work into the proposed new language. Um, because as we've seen all along, um, it's very difficult to actually regulate the problem behavior in a meaningful way. And so much of what we're trying to do is put in sort of proactive upstream measures um, that will serve as more of a deterrent as opposed to trying to actually cite and respond to that activity as it's happening or, or in response to it. Um, so for me individually, and, and I think I, I've heard the view shared amongst the council, this is a really important thing for us to try and work in here. And I understand um, your reticence to, to taking it on. There's, there's a few things though that from how you describe your concerns, I, I just wanted to have some discussion about. So the first was um, that um, you were sort of envisioning just this constant appeal cycle for decisions that might be rendered, whether you're the one that's actually, you know, making the decision or, or responsible for a hearing or if it winds up being somebody else. One of the things that I think we've done that's a really positive change to the to the um, propose, for the proposed language is that the, the uh, permits would run on a calendar basis, right? So whether you apply for the permit in January or you apply for it in November, you still have to read. So all of that activity is gonna be happening at the same time. So <laughs> I, would, I would imagine that any disputes around denial of permit would then become a much more condensed window, right? So if you're, you know, if we're issuing all of the permits in January and there's been some sort of component that factors in, well, what was your, you know, reported behavior like for the past year, you know, that feeds into that renewal or approval process, then, you know, in January and bleeding into February is probably when all those disputes would be, right? It's probably not going to continue on through the rest of the year, right? Well, it could. Uh, disputes can carry on for you know six months or a year in in superior court uh, that what you're saying does help it it helps concentrating those into January and February uh, but I do see it as uh, a, a double-edged sword where we're going to get evidence on both sides of the equation and likely get appealed I, I look at situations where my decision is going to be appealed regardless of what I decide. And, and, and those situations uh, are bad for legal expenses. And uh, so I see if we're going to, if we're going to have issues between neighbors that I'm going to have evidence submitted on both sides of the equation. I'm going to make a decision. It's going to it's going to be appealed to the zoning board of appeals, regardless of what decision I make, and uh, and then likely could go to superior court from there. Okay. Um, I understand. I mean, there's people that are just going to fight it no matter what. Is what basically what you're saying, as I understand it. But um, when we envisioned this, we were trying to make an analog to the current liquor license um, process. And so can you, can you help walk through what that, I mean, what, what does that look like for you? And, you know, if, if, if we, I mean, I, I don't think we've denied a liquor license in the fi almost five years that I've been on the council. It's a pretty perfunctory renewal kind of vote that we take almost every month. Um, but what does that look like? 
Well, liquor license. What are, the, what are some of the factors that go into like if if you were to if you were to provide us with a report that says, "Well, oh, I'm not so sure. I recommend you know uh, renewal of this license, and here's why." I, I I don't think I've seen one. Like I said, in the almost five years of doing that. Yes, and, and because those those establishments generally aren't bothersome to their neighbors, and we haven't received any complaints from the neighbors of those establishments. Uh, but if, if we did receive complaints from neighbors and the, in the liquor license, the way the license was structured said that if the council receives complaints, they may deny based on those complaints, I, I think that would become problematic for the council. Isn't that what it is, though? Uh, I don't. I don't know exactly how the law on liquor licenses is is written, uh, but but I, I guess the fact that we don't know because we haven't gotten complaints. Well, I I think it, it kind of goes to why I think this is important as a as more of a deterrent. So if people know if you're a short term rental operator and you know that your license to operate, your, your permit to, to conduct your business is potentially in jeopardy based on that, just in the same way the operator of a bar or restaurant that has a liquor license knows that if they have complaints or violations, their ability to continue to serve beer and wine might be disrupted, that they, they take a much more vested interest in ensuring that that doesn't happen. And so I'm not, I, I'm not saying that there won't be instances of people appealing and complaining, but I think the intent and purpose is if it was to operate in the same manner in which the liquor license permits do, then in my view, you just kind of prove the point that as a known and active deterrent, it, it serves to help to curtail the behavior. We go ahead, Chris. Or I'm sorry, I can't say that. <laughs> Chris, you can you can jump in. Uh, uh, respectful, I think uh, Jamie did a great job teeing this up. He succinctly summarized this is this is really a big issue we need to address. But I do think Ben has the better argument. I think Jamie, your argument actually proved the opposite point. Um, Using the liquor license analogy, liquor licenses are not issued for residential neighborhoods. They're in specific neighborhoods where they're compatible with the surrounding area. And you also can't dispense liquor if you don't have employees on the premises. So if we use the liquor analogy, it actually would tell us that we shouldn't be permitting these in the neighborhoods. Imagine how many complaints we would have if you could issue liquor licenses to anyone's house, anywhere in town, and people are allowed to just have people they don't know come to their house and just drink alcohol and like leave some money on the table when they're done. It, it, it would be a disaster. But yet that is in effect what we're doing with these short-term rental ordinances. So keep that in mind. Uh, the liquor license analogy for me weighs heavily in favor of we should not be permitting these whatsoever. Yeah, I'd agree with that to some extent. Uh, you know, re restaurants and bars are accepted socially and uh, we don't get complaints on restaurants and bars regularly and short-term rentals are a new thing that aren't as accepted and we're getting a lot of complaints on them. So it's not a perfect analogy. We could, uh, we, we could try it and see how it goes, but I, I foresee it being litigious and time consuming. I just think that we haven't had anything in place that effectively says to an operator, your ability to continue to operate will be in jeopardy if you do not, um, you know, up, you know, adhere to a certain set of standards um, and operate without complaint. And if I were an operator and I knew that that was what was on the line, I would act, much, I, I think, act in a much more, um, a manner of much more active oversight to ensure that my ability to continue to operate was preserved. Um, and that if, 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 I, if, if there was activity that jeopardized that, I would be much more serious about putting an end to that activity 
than what we have now, which is there is absolutely nothing that we can really do. Um, and um, you know, I understand all the problems that both you and, and Chief Fenton enumerated around um, you know, community policing policies and why should we be treating people that are in a short-term rental any differently than they're in any other residence in town and we wouldn't roll up on a regular residence. And first of all, you don't even know if it's a short-term rental property or not necessarily. Like there's a whole host of things that we've covered ad nauseum about why trying to you know, cite people for that activity sort of in real time is very difficult all around. Um, I think that building in a mechanism that hopefully proactively deters that is a pretty critical element to um, being able to have um, a successful regulated program here. And without it, I think a lot of this starts to fall apart. Can I respond directly to that? Um, it looks like Penny maybe wanted to respond directly. So I just want to give her a chance if that's the case. I'll, I'll let Chris go first, then I'll, then I'll go. So uh, Jamie, your logic is spot on, and it's in, in part what swayed me uh, onto your point of view with respect to hosted rentals, but I think it falls apart because as much as someone wants, when you're dealing with unhosted, because as much as someone wants to protect their ability to do the rentals and everything, if you're not there, if you're not present on site, there, there's no way to predict what this random person you have no relationship to that you, you may have done the best you could screening them on the internet from Kalamazoo, wherever they may be coming from. You have no idea who this person is and there's no way to predict what the impact will be. And because of that, as much as you might wanna protect your permit, you might wanna protect your ability to operate, it, it's not something that you'll be able to effectively do if you're not present on the property. So that's A, the risk they're assuming, and B, you know, a factor that they may weigh to say, you know what, this isn't something that I want to, I want to assume that risk, and so I'm not going to do it. So. Penny? Um, I'm uh, in agreement with Jamie because I think is, uh, if somebody chooses to enter into running a business, they uh, need to know that they're going to be held accountable to a certain uh, standard. I run a business, I have to meet a certain amount of standards, uh, even when I'm not there. And, um, and I'm a phone call away, and whoever is a primary resident uh, and um, unhosted, they should be a phone call away or any of the unhosted ones should be a phone call away. And if something happens, and I think we have to see how this works before we say it's not workable. And we can always come back to the table. Jamie? The other thing I was just gonna add is, I mean, I feel strongly about it that I think, you know, I, I would suggest that the council is necessary be the decisioning body like we are with liquor licenses um, so that we, you know, we're asking these people, you know, operating this business activity to be accountable. If this is what we want to hold the standard of operation accountable to, then, you know, I think we, it's within reason that we should be the ones to assume um, whatever, you know, um, avalanche or not might come our way in terms of the number of uh, instances where we might have to decision on something. Maybe it will be more like liquor licenses where they're relatively few and far between and it's a f fairly perfunctory thing, but um, you know, I, I, I'm fine with the council assuming that burden. Uh, it's that important to me um, to have included in this that I'm, you know, I, I, I don't, if the concern is we shouldn't pass it off to the ZBA, we shouldn't pass it off to, you know, certain staff members. Um, I have, I have no concern with us taking that on uh, and writing that into the ordinance. Um, Jamie, I think that's a really good idea because I agree this is a pretty important aspect of the ordinance, and I think you're right that just having it in there gives people an incentive to comply. Um, 
So quick show of hands from everyone who is in support of section F sub eight. Okay, so Penny, Jamie, Caitlin, sorry, I froze there for a minute, but then caught up and Jeremy. Good, okay, and Valerie. Um, and, and what about the second point Jamie made where the council takes on, and just, just to clarify, Jamie, you mean if Ben opts to deny based on this, the review comes to us? Right, so, uh, or, well, um, I don't know, maybe we need to think it through a little bit more in practice, but um, because um, as it stands today, again, if we just stick with the liquor license thing, those aren't coming to us for appeal, those are just coming to us for approval. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I would think that this would have to be only for those that are denied, right? If, if somebody's, we're not going to be the council is not going to be the one approving all permits. If there's no concern, there's no issue, and it gets approved for uh, renewal, then the council wouldn't have any. So I guess it would just be for appealing denials. Maureen, give us your wise counsel. Oh, um, you're going to be a little disappointed. I think what you want to do is have any appeal of Ben's decision go to the council because honestly if he issues a permit people are going to want to appeal that if he denies a permit people are going to want to deny that and at least if you want to be the receiving body you probably need to be the appeal body um i think so that how does that work like who has standing to appeal uh, the uh, issuance it, well typically any, I mean, I'll, I'll let Ben step in, but I know when I've worked with the town attorney, it's like anybody who can prove any interest and it's not that hard, even if you're not living nearby, but you're a resident that you can prove you've got some standing. And the idea would be that, you know, someone applies for a permit, Ben says, you've got, per you've got complaints, I say no. So the STR permit holder could appeal to the council or someone uh, applies for a permit and he grants it and the neighbors or whomever say, well, we're gonna, we don't think he should have given him that permit. We've had problems. They want to appeal his decision that way as well. Jeremy. So it sounds to me like the needle we're trying to thread here is we don't want to have the council have to approve every short-term rental permit every year. Um, we, and we, so we want to distinguish between properties where we have had no, which is what, essentially what we do with liquor licenses, right? Even if there's no complaints, we still vote on them. Um, we want to distinguish between properties where there are some issues, and properties where uh, there are no issues, and enable Ben to issue the permits that are where there's no, no documented issues of any kind, and then have some mechanism for the council to review the other permits, whether that, and that could either be requesting that the code enforcement officer forward to the council any permits for properties that have documented violations of the good neighbor policy and the council just votes on it de novo, or we make the council be the appellate body subject to Ben's original determination. I, I could see the merits of going either way. Um, but I think that's the question you know, before us. Um, I think as we're talking about this that we need to add in the enforcement of um, what Mr. Howard was talking about earlier. Um, if someone says that they are a primary owner of the home and they aren't, how are we enforcing that also? True, it's a felony, but what's the process? Is that also going to be something that Ben says this has happened and then we send it to the district attorney or does it come before the council? 
I think we need to talk about enforcement of that also and make that um, a part of this discussion. I mean, I think in that case, if the police had sufficient evidence to charge, they could just charge and then it would go to the district attorney for prosecution, right? Um, I don't know if Ben, Maureen, Valerie, anyone wants to respond to that? Well, it, we don't have anything written in as a procedure though. So Ben might, Ben, does he know that that's his position that he's supposed to contact the police? The police are supposed to contact the DA or complaints um, filed, charges are filed. I think we need to put in there some sort of process. Right. I don't know what that process would look like. I would talk to the, the, the tax assessor and the chief of police and let them know my concern and that's as far as I would take it. Uh, Maureen, I was going to ask, do we need something in the ordinance to address this? Well, I mean, we can, we can add as much to the ordinance as you want to add, but um, if, some, if Ben issues a permit based on um, someone asserting that they, ha they are a primary resident in Cape Elizabeth, he's going to check with the assessor, the assessor is going to check the homestead exemption. The homestead exemption, remember, is a separate standalone statute that has its own enforcement provisions. And I think we want to try to let the assessor do his thing and not um, muddle the code officer and the assessor's responsibilities. So uh, if someone asserts there they have a homestead uh, rights and the assessor determines that that's not correct, we should let the assessor figure that out on his own with the state statute that's already in place. And then uh, Ben would handle the short-term rental permit. If he's issued a permit, and Ben, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but if you've issued a permit based on someone's assertion that their primary residence is in Cape Elizabeth, and he's notified by the code, the assessor that that is no longer the case or that never was the case, uh, I would assume at that point, Ben would revoke the short-term rental permit. And if they continue to operate a short-term rental without their permit, the ordinance has provisions in it that talk about how to go after that. And, you know, frankly, that's, that's why we have the third party enforcement. And that's probably going to be more of a superior court and town attorney type of enforcement. Matt, did you have something to add to that? Yeah, just as far as verification of ownership, uh, there are, there's a litmus test that also comes. It, it's not as easy as just signing it, signing the homestead exemption. There are other ways to also ver that the assessor does to verify if it's their primary residence. They'll look at, you know, they, the person certifies that this is their, they're, they're filing as a main resident, and then they're also saying on their driver's license, this is their home address. Uh, the legal resident, you know, if they're fishing or a hunter, uh, that it's that address on their license there and they also pay motor vehicle excise tax in the in the in the town identifying that as their address and then finally that they're a registered voter and they're identifying that as their address as well so there are a number of ways that you know you go in and and, and verify uh, their residency status and if they go through all those hoops to do that so they can uh, uh, short-term rental it's going to be awfully tough to catch them but most folks are legitimate when they do identify that and then over time, you, you do have to qualify your data and just verify that a person may have, uh, you know, they may, they may have it in error and you just remove that and then uh, you could address that as well. So that could be just part of the process of verifying their, their residency status there, which the, is the normal process of things. Okay, so it sounds like that is taken care of and more just a matter of education making sure that everyone in the process knows their role, that it, we don't need to add to the ordinance. Is that accurate? Just, just head nods. Yeah, from Maureen and Matt. Okay. Um, so, Jamie, did you want to get back to um, the discussion of um, review? Uh, yeah, I do. Uh, I, a question of clarification. The current um, ordinance does not allow for an appeals opportunity. Is that correct? 
no, that's not correct, or no, you, you can't. Maureen, you can go ahead. Ben, please correct me, but any decision that Ben makes under the zoning ordinance, it can be taken to the zoning board as an administrative appeal. So people always have an opportunity to appeal. Is that correct? That's correct. So we would have to specifically exempt this process from the existing process for an appeal to come to the town council? Uh, well, there's this, that's section eight talks about the appeal going, I mean, that it says Ben makes the de decision and then it goes to the zoning board. If you make a determination that you want it to go to the council, then I'll just revise that subsection eight. So since this uh, or current ordinance went into effect in 2012, have there been any administrative appeals of Ben's decision to issue a permit to any short-term rental operator? So I'm guessing that people haven't known that that's an opportunity available to them, um, but, and maybe there will suddenly be <laughs> a flood of appeals, um, but, over the course of eight years, people have had a chance to appeal those decisions and haven't. I, I, don't, I don't know if other counselors are concerned about um, an overwhelming volume of appeals, but eight years of, of not, they're not being won. Um, Maureen and Ben. I was, I was just gonna say you're, you know, there has, there's not in the current ordinance, there's not a lot of basis for appeal uh, for the issuance of a permit, but adding that provision about the good neighbor guidelines, you're, you're just adding a lot of meat to the bone for appeal. Right, but on the most basic basis, somebody who has had you know, legitimate complaints about activity could say, well, I just don't think that this person should be able to have a permit and I'm gonna fight about it. And nobody's pursued that avenue to date. It's just interesting to me that there might not be much basis for them to do that, but it, it strikes me as interesting that the number of, you know, legitimate concerns that we've received that nobody has pursued that avenue. Maureen. Well, again, you know, when, when someone makes, uh, submits a permit to Ben, nobody knows that's happening. There's no noticing requirement and I please don't, think that now we need to put in a noticing requirement but so they they don't they don't realize there's a short-term rental until something goes wrong and then we've had a lot of people though maureen that have done more i don't mean to interrupt you but we've had a lot of people that as you've seen have done more than their fair share of research and homework on this that could easily determine when somebody's permit was issued which is public information and know that it would be up for renewal and if they were if they were that hacked off about it you know, inter intercede into the process at that point, and nobody's done that. Well, that's because the standards for getting a permit are not the problem with what they have with the short term rental. I mean, the existing. But even if it was to just make life difficult for the operator, I mean, you know, and to, and to try and gum up the works. I think people are relying on the existing provisions in the ordinance that talk about complaints, substantiated complaints. And that's, that's the process they've been trying to use to challenge these permits in the end. But if you look at the standards, I mean, as long as you've got a septic system and you're not proposing more people sleeping over and you're meeting the building code requirements, there's not a lot for neighbors to chew on about, I mean, it, there have been complaints about the people that are having the turnover one more than every seven days, but they're going through the substantiated complaint process. Right, and that's kind of what we told them to do when they initially came to the council and they asked, what should we do if there are issues? And we said, make complaints. Um, Chris, did you wanna jump in on that? Uh, I, I want to go back, uh, make a, just a comment on the good neighbor conduct um, components as to what constitutes disruptive behavior. Um, are you, you want to, can I touch on that or did you want to continue to debate these other issues? Um, I don't, I don't think we need to debate the other issues, but I kind of just wanted to move in the direction of um, the 
um, review versus. Yep. Uh, so I just want to point out that it says disruptive outdoor behavior may include, but is not limited to smoking, swearing, lewd gestures or conduct, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so as a big fan of George Carlin, uh, I just wanted to highlight the fact that we are saying that we're potentially, people may end up having their permits revoked based on the content of their speech, it sounds like. We're saying if you swear, you may lose your permit. So we're basically, one could argue, we might be putting in something that could be construed as an anti-swearing punishment. Um, also, we're restricting smoking on private property. Um, so I just wanted to highlight we're doing this. Uh, same with lewd gestures or content. Again, that's content. I wonder whether that's content-based restrictions that we're engaging in. Um, I also think that this is <laughs> this is going to be a hornet's nest, this section. And I think uh, I, I'm very curious. I'm not going to be around. <laughs> you guys are going to deal with this, not me. Uh, I'm very curious to see how many uh, unhosted short-term rentals survive more than two years with this thing in place. But who knows? Uh, I could be totally wrong and there will be no complaints. Um. Sorry, I'm just trying to manage two documents here. Um, I see your point. It looks like Valerie, did you have a response to that? I just want to say that um, it's getting really late and we have a lot of people here um, that are here regarding the um, diversity committee. We also have people here regarding the solar um, our energy committee. And it sounds like we may need to have more discussion around um, this good neighbor policy that Chris just brought up. What, what are your thoughts, um, Madam Chair? Yeah, it, I noticed it's definitely getting late and we have um, another big item on the workshop agenda, um, which is a little more time sensitive. So I would be fine with scheduling another workshop on the short-term rentals, but I also feel like we could be pretty close to consensus. So maybe let's just take a, a quick poll on um, who, just first of all, who's, who's in favor of um, changing the process of review? as opposed to leaving it as it's proposed in, okay, so this would be entering into that discussion about changing the review process and changing that good neighbor conduct paragraph, either one of those who feels like we need to discuss that more and change it. So Valerie, Caitlin, Jeremy, Chris. Um, okay, uh, generally show of hands on who thinks we should maybe continue this discussion another evening. We'll plow through. We plow through. Show of hands, Matt. I'm not voting, Madam Chair. I I, I had a a question uh, or something that the council may want to consider. Is this uh, perhaps you 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 have uh, the finish line in many ways in sight? Uh, perhaps it could be an opportunity to refer this to the planning board and get uh, some of their opinion points on the good neighbor policy as well. To come back for the council to consider and then you can have that as additional uh therapy if you will when you do when you go forward to discuss it again because we'll come back to the council with their recommendations and review and then you can have that as additional uh you know some some things as it, you are getting late uh it's difficult to to identify all those issues but you've really circled uh many of the many of the parts on the game board so to speak to uh to keep it moving forward so that might be an additional strategy uh, for the council to consider. Um, I hear that and I think though at the last meeting, I can't remember who had said it, but there was sort of a sense that we should send to the planning board what we intend to be the ordinance. Um, so I, I think that might be a good idea for these two remaining issues. Um, Jeremy? Um, yeah, with respect, I, I feel like the, the issues on the, the daily rental caps um, was a more substantive issue than, than the, I, th this, 
I, I think we can pose this as a question to the planning board around the process and in particular as it's a process that the planning board is involved with as regards to other land use regulations. Um, I would value their input on this question. I think this ordinance is inside the five yard line um, in terms of where I'd like to see it. And I'm okay to, um, I, I, I'm more than glad to forward it to the planning board and just highlight this is a question where we would value their, their input. Does anyone disagree with sending what we have to the planning board and closing out with this, this discussion? Raise hand now if you disagree. Okay, I, I, I know Chris. Um, all right, so we will close this discussion and move on to the next one, which is the IDEA Committee. Um, okay, so when we last met, we were sort of reworking the charge for the IDEA Committee. Um, and I know we do, as Valerie mentioned, have a number of attendees who are here on this specific issue. Um, so I'd like to open the floor for any public comment. Um, please use the raise hand feature on Zoom. Um, please do identify yourself by name and address and try to limit your comments to about three minutes per person. Um, Paul, go ahead. Matt will unmute and then you, you have to unmute yourself. Unmuted. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Good. Uh, so I will propose another name for the committee and uh, my reasoning behind that. I'll preface my remark by, it's my remarks aren't, aren't long. I'll preface my, my remark by noting a belief that it matters how we publicly identify what we are uh, as a beacon for what we do. So, mm -hmm. First, the committee's objective at their root, uh, objectives at their root are not designed to manifest on the level of ideas. Ideas are immaterial. Actions exist on the ground affecting material reality. So the first impression of idea with two A's is misleading in terms of focus and objective, I'd argue. Second, in part because this is to be a civic body I believe the name ought to be located in a municipal milieu. Therefore, I propose the name Civil Rights Committee to remedy those concerns. This proposed name has been part of recent Cape community conversation and has community support. I'll give extra emphasis to this next point as it was raised by another community member at another meeting and appeared to us to be swiftly dismissed as inconsequential. Civil Rights Committee would avoid confusion <clears throat> and conflation with the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. More so, it in, avoids any perception or, of co-optation or misappropriation of that, or, of that act's name, which is an optics matter so easily avoided. Idea with 1A, dealing with social marginalization, education, and political presence should have its own name unconfused with idea with two A's dealing with marginalization, education, and political presence. The name Civil Rights Committee doesn't require learning what it is by expanding an acronym, it is readily understandable to the public and the press, locates, locates its fundamental purpose, and is inspirationally associated with empowerment and the arc of justice and appropriately identifies it in the national history you are making tonight on the local level. Thank you for your serious and thoughtful consideration of this proposal. Thank you. Um, anyone else from the public with a comment on this item? Um, Audra? Thank you for taking my call. Audra Gore, 215 Two Lights Road. Um, I agree with what Paul just shared, though I do like the words that we chose to, as far as the inclusion, diversity, equity, anti-racism, and awareness. So I hope that those could be reincorporated. Um, the other thing in the latest revision that I was able to download, uh, removed is 
the part about explore community outreach to engage the community and receive input on racism and inclusivity. And I feel like this is a really key point. Uh, and I would love for that to be included back in. That was letter H in the previous document, um, which isn't in the, the latest revision. But I hope that this moves forward tonight and that a yes vote can be had. And thank you. Thank you. Jen? Thank you again for taking your time to talk this through with us. Seven Brentwood Road, Cape Elizabeth, Jen McVeigh, and I also wanted to echo the same um, sentiment as Paul is creating this as a civil rights committee and having heard what Audra just said too, I think a lot of those key components need to be considered in this and I think a lot of that will happen as we develop the ad hoc committee but I think our primary goal is to make sure that this does not get pushed out any further than tonight because we really need to start moving forward with this. So again, thank you for tabling the short-term rentals to get to us. <laughs> we appreciate it. Thank you. Um, and thank you everyone for your patience. I know it was a long discussion we had ahead of this one. Um, anyone else from the public um, with a comment on this item? Uh, Paul? Hi, I just wanted to say Paul Seidman, 21 Oakview Drive. Thanks. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, um, I don't see any other hand. Oh. Yes, John. Hey guys, John, can you hear me okay? John Cessary, 9 Old Fort Road. I just wanna uh, thank you guys again for having this meeting and for doing all such great work. And hi Matt, how are you? Um, I just wanna also say that uh, I agree with Paul and Audra and Jennifer. I like the civil rights name way better than the idea. Not that the idea didn't have its merits, but uh, I think we should, be more direct. And I also agree with Audra on point H that we kind of crossed over. I think uh, community outreach is an important part that we should somehow figure out how to word and re-include. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Um, all right. So just to note, we do have 18 attendees at this point. I think we had a high of 26 or 27 previously. Um, just so we all know that. Um, all right, so I don't see any other hands raised um, in the attendees. So um, I do see Valerie D wanting to kick off the discussion and then Penny, so go ahead, Valerie. Well, first of all, I'd just like to thank everyone in attendance for hanging in there with us and um, for participating in this. It's really important that you're um, a part of this and your voices are heard. I, um, I really like Paul's idea about the Civil Rights Committee. I think the name is great. Um, we were just looking for some sort of a name for it, but I, I think this is very clear and um, straightforward. As to um, H, that was just accidentally left out. Um, I went through this to revise it so that we wouldn't have as much to revise tonight. Um, and maybe Matt, can you, would that be okay, um, Chair Adams, if Matt puts the uh, document up on the computer? Yeah, definitely. So um, we can add H back in. It would be number eight. It was just um, accidentally left out during the cut and paste, that's all. And, and you can see that okay. I just want to confirm if, yes. if you're getting good visual. Okay, yep. thank you, sorry. Thank you. Um, Penny. Yeah, I, uh, number one, um, I'm so glad Paul brought up uh, civil rights. That's what I was going to suggest um, uh, last week as, uh, a name for this uh, ad hoc committee and what will ideally become an ongoing committee. I also wanted to say, and I'm not sure I'm going to articulate this very well, but I'll count on my 
pal, uh, Chris, for always being able to interpret what I say. Um, I truly believe that um, this ad hoc committee has a near term um, set of uh, actions um, which then transform into a, uh, a long term set of um, strategies and um, I would say actions as well. Um, I truly believe that one of the first charges of this committee is to assess what can be done immediately and to identify the purpose and the direction for a permanent committee and to bring that to the council um, as soon as uh, feasible. I think that a um, an end date that was in here of uh, December 31st, uh, 2021. I think the ad hoc committee should actually have um, a shorter time frame in order that a permanent committee get put in place uh, as soon as possible. Um, I'm not saying that we, um, we uh, not take action on some things that we know are important out of the chute, but I truly believe this ad hoc committee can put a, um, a plan together that says, here's what a permanent committee will do over the next 12 to 24 to 36 months. I believe that a permanent committee is something that needs to be part of Cape Elizabeth, uh, from now to eternity. It's something that I think every community should have had many years ago and we wouldn't find ourselves in this place. So I think in order that we demonstrate the commitment to the work around uh, civil rights um, and anti-racism and truly moving Cape Elizabeth to the forefront in action that we charge uh, the committee with identifying what the permanent committee will be doing with what are some near-term actions that need to be done within the next uh, two months, four months, and um, what the charge and direction of the permanent uh, civil rights committee will be for Cape Elizabeth. Penny, do you think, are you um, saying you think that the, the ad hoc committee should have a term of two to four months or we should put in like a yes. report? No, I really think, I truly believe that uh, what we're doing here is saying the ad hoc committee is going to be put in place because we truly see the importance of um, this issue in our community, in our state, and in our country, and that um, it's a way to get some things going and direction set, because we know that to um, put a permanent committee in place requires uh, the ordinance committee, et cetera, et cetera, and it needs to go to the council. So I think that process needs to start immediately. And once that permanent committee is in place, the ad hoc committee dissolves. Um, I think that's a really great point. Um, I've never served on an ad hoc committee and I don't know how easily it is to, to get the work done to get to that point. So I don't know if there's someone on the council who has an idea of how much time would be um, enough without taking more time than necessary. Does anyone have a sense of whether two months is appropriate or too short? Jamie? Um, I, I agree with all of the sentiment that number one, it, it's clear that there's a need for a permanent committee and number two, um, we're even expressly including that in the charge for this ad hoc committee. I think as as we all know, just from you know operating as a council, 
and seeing, you know, some of us have been on other committees. It, it just, it's challenging sometimes to get stuff scheduled. I mean, none of us are doing this full time. Um, you know, we, we uh, benefit greatly from the um, willingness of citizens to, to, you know, give of their time and talent um, to staff these committees. We, you know, rely also on, on staff people to be involved. In this case, it's recommended that the manager be involved. So that's somebody that already has significant other demands on his time as well. I think, I think it's just that I, I know many of us come to the council um, when we, when we first got elected or, or first come to sit on a committee. And I know I was surprised. I suspect many of the rest of you were in terms of the pace at which we move through things. And I know it's a common criticism from the public um, sometimes that, oh, why can't you just do this faster? And the fact of the matter is, is that sometimes even, even as fast as we're able to do something is just not fast enough for people. So um, I suspect we would need more than two to four months just on the basis of scheduling. Um, I, I think based on interest in some of this um, work uh, that there are likely to be um, people who may have a lot of other demands on their time, uh, people that are, uh, you know, parents of young children, uh, uh, so on and so forth. So I think, I think it'll be difficult to get people meeting and, and get all that work done in a super compressed amount of time. Um, Caitlin? Yeah, I would rather leave the date as it is and they can always finish their recommendations early, but changing the date would put more pressure on, I would think. Do you get what I mean? Like we're gonna have to have so much time to get the committee in place, so much time to get that first meeting established, which always seems to take forever. And then to a couple months to get the ball rolling from there. So, I mean, I don't think December 2021 is unreasonable, but like I said, they could be done in July and give us a report in July. We're not going to shelf it until December. So when they're done their work, they're done their work. Matt, I see your hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair. If I may, uh, the one other item to consider is uh, uh, Zoom meetings in the time of COVID and getting a group organized and uh, as well as trying to be productive is a bit of a challenge and uh, the extra time might be beneficial, especially as you go through the appointments process and get people on board. And then, yeah, you do have the organized, organizing time. You have the holidays that will run into this at some point as well. So uh, as, as Councilor Jordan pointed out, you can, uh, Caitlin uh, had pointed out that it doesn't mean that you, ha you have to wait until then to come forward with your recommendations. If they are found sooner, uh, that's great, uh, but it's, it may be important to have that time, but uh, not. Uh, but I think you could. I think you can get organized. But there are some challenges now as far as working with committees that uh, we haven't been experiencing up until, uh, quite frankly, March of 2020. So, something to consider. Penny, I just I I think what's important um, to me is that the, uh, because I know the formation of the permanent committee uh, can um, take a few steps as we look at going to the council, going to the ordinance committee, going to public and all of those things, that that be highlighted as a, uh, a priority for this group so that we can get that going and get it established. Um, and um, get it as a, um, an ongoing part of uh, Cape Elizabeth's committee structure. Um, I, I also know that policy reviews can take, you can get um, enmeshed in that. And I think there's a, um, there are some that we want to look at out of, out of the chute, but there are others that go into a plan that the permanent committee may look at because you can't do everything at once. And public awareness is another thing that's uh, critical um, at, at the onset. So those are the types of things I 
think about that this ad hoc committee is going to be uh, um, having almost a, a, a dual uh, focus at the onset. And one is near term, one is long term, and establishing that long term uh, vision and direction is key from my perspective. So whether I will, I will agree with my peers, Jamie and Caitlin, and say, yeah, you're probably right, because I'm usually overly optimistic. Um, so keep the date there. But I think we need to be vigilant about saying how critically important we feel this is at this point, and not let it fall along the wayside and, and lose momentum because it's important. Valerie and then Chris. I, I agree, um, Penny. Um, but one of the things I wanna point out is the people that came to attended our meeting and the people I've talked to have amazing energy and passion about this. They're not gonna let it languish uh, it's going to happen. They're going to push this through. And I think that um, once it gets started, they'll have an idea of how quickly they can get this standing committee set up. And if they want to tackle some of the issues or put them all over for the standing committee, I think that um, we have an amazing group of people that um, are super passionate about this. And it's, they're going to they're gonna take off. They're gonna, they're gonna take it and run with it. Chris, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so to, to, to Penny's point, um, I think with the way that the purpose in charge is structured, uh, the first draft was really structured uh, in the format that one would find for a permanent committee. And now this is, uh, that, that structure has been transformed into this, uh, into the ad hoc committee format. But the duty section has basically been carried over from the, uh, the permanent committee structure. And I, I think the issue that Penny is getting at is that the duties are very broad because it's a, here's your long-term, what you're gonna be doing as one would see in a permanent committee. Uh, but per, but uh, the question is, if it's an ad hoc committee, they're supposed to be given like a, here's your task, here's the work product you're supposed to be generating with more specific guidance of here's what we want from you and we want it in, in the near term. And by virtue of having the broad duties and not prioritizing for them, it opens us up to the possibility that the group may, as much as we would want it to be moving forward, firing all cylinders, it might because it has such a broad um, charge, it might end up uh, becoming bogged down and not moving forward. It, and it stinks because I understand how it was like, oh, we want to get to the meat and the potatoes. We want to get to the, the substantive stuff. But to Penny's point, it is perhaps what the charge should be for the ad hoc committee. And I totally understand that I'm saying, oh, we're just going to make everything take forever. But that's not the intent. It's just government stinks. It's, but it's the best thing we got. It's better than everything else we've tried. Things move slow and there's a reason they move slow and it's to ensure everyone has an opportunity to have a voice. It's to ensure that everyone is uh, included and given an opportunity to participate. And uh, when you do that with 10,000 people, things move slow. Uh, but per, it, it perhaps to Penny's point would be the charge is give us the, give us the explicit uh, like standing committee. We want the standing committee description laid out with everything it's gonna do. Uh, and that's your initial charge that we're giving to you. Only once you've accomplished that do you move on to the other stuff. But it could be that everyone would say, no, 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 no. We want to get into media potatoes now. Don't worry about that. But I am concerned that things then get bogged down and nothing is accomplished. And to uh, Paul's point, I, I, I was scratching my head when I saw the idea thing. I like something about this. But I, I, I think, uh, yeah, the Americans with Disabilities Act, I studied that in college. You know, ah, that's, that's where it was coming from. So I, I totally am on board with going the other direction for the name. Um, Valerie, did you have your hand still up or is it a new? New. I was just going to respond to, um, to Chris and Penny. Um, I think that this began as uh, a permanent committee 
and we started setting it up that way and then thought, oh, it should be an ad hoc because the committee should decide what the name is and what, the, what they want to do and bring it back to the council instead of the council deciding what they should do. So that's why it's a little um, confusing. I just sort of copied it all over and added some of that in and thought that tonight in our um, workshop, we'd talk about the charge and if we want to tweak that so that we get this really streamlined and they're off and running. So um, I, I agree, maybe we reduce all of the duties, create it as um, a charge to set up a committee, standing committee. Penny? Um, I, here's the way I look at it because I don't want to lose sight of near term immediate action. So an ad hoc committee to assess immediate actions proposed a permanent committee to the council. I mean, that's basically the way I look at it because I, I also know that there are uh, many things that can be done uh, by this ad hoc committee that is um, really creating uh, awareness uh, uh, across uh, the community and at the same time uh, identifying really what a permanent um, civil rights committee would be in Cape Elizabeth and then as they when they are Form from a permanent perspective, people are going to have already seen action and positive action. Um, I think to get mired too deeply into assessing policies and uh, things like that at this point in time will um, will um, get a bit bogged down. And I understand what you said, Valerie, about uh, initially it was thought of as as permanent, but the duties the the duties that were outlined just um, um, kept shouting to me, this is permanent stuff that needs to be done and needs to be done in a, in a planful way, in a prioritized way, and in, in an ongoing way. And that's what a permanent committee does. So I say assess uh, immediate actions and propose um, the uh, permanent committee is what I look at as for this group. Um, Penny, I just wanted to note what you said, and I only got to propose assess immediate actions and propose. What did you say? I was muted. Oh, assess immediate actions and propose. What was the uh, and propose a permanent committee um, to the council a, a permanent um, that's all I wrote that was my little statement to myself as to what I thought the purpose of the committee was um, um, yeah and uh, it makes sense Valerie what you said about the starting as a permanent committee now looking at it um, Generally, what do, and can you just use the raise hand feature? Cause I can't see everyone when I have the screen share up. Um, just generally, um, counselors raise hands who, who's in support of reducing the duties um, down to more of an ad hoc style. Um, maybe something along the lines of what Penny proposed, maybe a little more. So Chris, Caitlin, Valerie, Jeremy, Penny. Um, okay. Uh, Jamie. I'm just wondering if there was any thought to go in the other direction and just advancing to a standing committee. I, I, it, it strikes me as odd that out of the gate, we're already talking about this need for a permanent standing committee and uh, that being the very first action to take, it seems like just as much time could be spent, invested in the work to go through the process to stand up that committee. I, I don't know. I, I, 
So, I, I mean, my, not, I'm, I'm not clear what, what time we're actually saving, I guess, is the point. My concern would be that um, we are an all white council and obviously, you know, all coming from our points of privilege that the committee itself, the standing committee would be more meaningful if it was created by the community and not us. And I don't know what other people think about that, but um, that's kind of the sense that I'm feeling. Uh, Jeremy? I, okay, okay, can I just, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by cr not created by, I mean, we, we'd still be the ones managing the appointments process and I'm not, I'm not sure I follow. That we, if we give develop an ad hoc committee to then advise on creating the permanent committee, those ideas about what that permanent committee needs to do and what the issues are and you know what what training is needed that's that's coming from the community and not from us. So there are obviously things that we are going to be blind to that this committee might be better able to delve into and you know. It seems like it would be a, a richer and frankly a more anti-racist approach than us sort of saying top down, this is the committee that needs to happen. Um, there, there are hands and hands on the side and, and hands in the view. So Caitlin had her hand up um, and then Penny and then Valerie and Jeremy was waving his hand. So I'm going to go to Caitlin first. Yay. Um, no, I was going to say the exact same thing. I think we need to go to the ad hoc committee so that they can develop the the purpose and the meat of what the standing committee is going to be because it shouldn't be our place to be trying to figure that out. It will take even longer, I feel, in the end than, let, than doing it this way. It won't do it justice. I, I, if I could just jump in, Valerie, I, I, I thought that that's what this represented. So maybe I'm just mistaken and not understanding what stakeholder input has led to this to begin with. So that's, if I'm just misunderstanding that, then then that's fine. I, I thought that that's what we were looking at reflected. So maybe not. You mean stakeholder input to develop this particular charge? And, and what the focus would be and the thing, yeah. So, the, you know, the, I thought that there had been a sort of cooperative uh, stakeholder process that led to this being the recommendation to begin with. It sounded like a, a lot of the folks that have a vested interest in this had, had been involved in a participatory way, so. Um, did, Jeremy has his hand up. I wanna go to either you or Valerie. Um, Valerie was. Go ahead, Jeremy, and then I and then I'll. So many hands. <laughs> um, I was just going to say, I so I um, I think th there was a, a good faith effort, and I think we did a, a good job of reaching out to people and getting some community input on this charge. Um, I, but at the same time, I think also before we commit to a, I mean, obviously we could change the charge for a permanent committee. But uh, before we commit to a permanent committee, I think there's a mix of things that that committee could do, some of which are on this list, you know, policy review, sort of tasks to recommend policies to the council. But there may also be other things that, that folks would like to bring forward in, in a more standing role, such as some type of oversight, um, you know, oms, ombudsman type role or something like that. Um, and, and, and I think the, the the permanent committee charge would benefit from some additional discussion from folks who are more involved in and have more knowledge and understanding about the issues around racism than, than I do. Um, okay, so Penny had her hand up and then Valerie. All I wanted to do is I was kind of wanted to respond to uh, uh, Jamie. My my thought is, I mean, um, I, I agree with what um, Valerie Adams has said and Caitlin that 
um, this ad hoc committee is is about um, input to forming the permanent. Um, I also feel that this ad hoc committee, and I will keep saying it, there are near term actions that can be taken. And so it's this team, this group, this committee has two charges. And, um, and then uh, we will know what does this committee need to look like and what is its ongoing um, uh, set of duties and responsibilities. Uh, but I agree with them that it's not up to us at this point in time to define what that is. I really want to hear from the people on the ground what they see. Valerie? Yes, in, in response to, um, to Jamie, we did have a lot of people that um, participated. However, there's a lot of people that couldn't make it and weren't able to to participate. And then uh, we, we got a lot of input and put this together, but then it became a workshop like it is now where it was us discussing it, putting it to putting in all the words. And it wasn't a back and forth, which an ad hoc committee would have with each other. They'd have more of a back and forth and a discussion around it. So I really think that um, Penny's idea is right on with getting this commit this ad hoc committee together, they can decide what the name is, they can just get everything set up and have the two charges. That really makes sense. And I think that it'll happen quickly. And, and I also understand, Jamie, why take the other step when we can just set up a, a committee right now. But I think it'll be more, um, uh, more real to the community and to the people of the community if they're the ones creating it rather than us establishing it. So, um, and more, uh, so I'd like to propose that we do that, um, set up the two charges as Penny suggested and um, change the name to um, Civil Rights Committee and allow um, the ad hoc committee to decide the name um, going forward for the standing committee. Um, okay. So, let's start with the committee name um, for the ad hoc committee, just sort of knock off some of these smaller items and then see if we can get through this. So um, quick show of hands, everyone who likes the civil rights committee name. Um, Penny. That are human rights. That are human rights, is that what you said? Okay, um, so we'll just start with civil rights. So it looks like everyone likes civil rights committee, okay. Um, so we will change it to Civil Rights Committee. And then Valerie had um, accidentally eliminated a point, but it sounds like maybe we're moving away from that. So we'll come back to that. Um, in terms of the charge for the ad hoc committee, Penny had proposed um, some language, assess immediate actions and propose a permanent committee to the council. Um, I do think we need to be, we need to beef it up a little bit more um, just to be a little more, more specific, um, but just quick show of hands, um, everyone's sort of in favor of that as a starting point. Um, generally everybody, okay. Um, I also wanted to note before we get too far away from it that we did get a lot of emails and um, one of the emails um, had suggested a change to the purpose to add after sy systemic racism. Um, so it's the second line of the committee purpose 
um, contribute to systemic and structural racism, um, which is a small change, but seemed kind of important. So getting some nods, is that okay with everyone if we add in structural? Yes, okay. Um, all right. So what we would then have Moving down to the duties of committee, we would have the Civil Rights Committee shall have the following duties. Do we want to leave in number one as part of the ad hoc committee? Um, show of hands for leaving in number one of the, the draft that Valerie had sent around. Penny, I. Um, underneath, where'd you go? Ah. I'm running out of battery power. Uh oh. Hold on. I gotta plug in. These long meetings aren't good. Also, while she's doing that, that's 10 out of 6. Um, do we have to take a vote for a workshop meeting to go past 10 o'clock? Just when you, get, when you get to the meeting uh, portion of the uh, is when you'll have to suspend council rules to uh, to go forward with actually having the council meeting. Okay. Madam Chair. I, and I did make the change that you uh, asked for under, as you can uh, see on your screen, about uh, uh, systemic uh, and structural racism. So I have that edit inserted. Okay. Oh, I see. Yeah. Do you mind also, while you have that document up, just changing the name of the committee so we have that yes. in there? Um. Oh my. Did anyone else have a thought while, while Penny's <laughs> on the back? Yeah. Okay. I don't know if it's going to work. My iPad is all heated up here. Okay. Penny, I think you're muted. Did you have a... Yep. Okay, here I am. Um, I don't know how much detail you want to go through here for number one, but um, I'm not a, um, this is wordsmithy and you guys are going to get mad at me. Um, interface, people, people don't interface. I learned that a long time ago. Um, but we can identify and pursue opportunities for collaboration uh, with another committee. Uh, so with the school committee. So I say identify and pursue. I got, I got a bunch of wordsmithy kind of things that I'm more than willing to um, kind of send along to somebody, but that was mine on um, the first one. Okay. Well, it sounds like we might be sort of moving in the direction of taking out a lot of these. Mm -hmm. so if you have some... I would think that I would think that this ad hoc committee needs to identify and pursue ways that collaboration because that's going to become part of the uh, ongoing, I would assume. So they're going to touch on that. Yeah. Um, okay. So identify and pursue opportunities for collaboration. Um, Jeannie? I, I'm just, I, I've just been confused based on what Penny, the direction you were heading in before. Are not two and three basically it, and then everything else that follows will be the recommendation for the standing committee? Right. So that's what I was saying is that do, based on that, do we want to leave in number one, which is which could go either way? That could be something for the ad hoc or be more of a long. It's going. It's going to fall into the definition of the ongoing committee as one of its responsibilities. Correct. Right. Is it also something that we, because we're now paring down what the ad hoc committee does so that it's essentially establishing com the committee. Okay, I see what you're saying. Yes. We want yes. to keep that one in 
for an ad hoc committee. My poor iPad, it's overheating. Yeah, my computer's doing the same. Um, so just general show of hands, um, do we want to leave in item number one as part of the ad hoc committee? Um, zoom, zoom hands, please. Jamie, Jeremy. Justin. Sorry, my hand was still raised. I, 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 my, I, I thought we were just going to two and three, so. If I, I maybe flip it around the other way to say if, if anyone wants to keep anything other than two and three voice in on what you want to keep. Yeah, that sounds good. Because I think that is the direction we're heading in. Um, so if anyone has any comment on keeping in anything other than two and three, which we can wordsmith if we need to hand up. Okay, Jeremy, go ahead. I just want to say I think there is some value in keeping one in because the school board is going through a similar process at the same time and there may be opportunities for those two groups as they're developing the ideas for a permanent community committee to be talking with each other and exploring how that moves forward collaboratively in the future. If it comes out, I'm fine with that. I think you could say it's implicit, but since these two processes are moving on, moving along in parallel, I think it makes some sense to reference them. But I could go either way. Um, do, do you think maybe it makes some sense to uh, reference that? Well, I was going to say to incorporate it into number two, but I think if we do that, then anyone could argue that we could incorporate anything into that as a, an including this, including that. Um, So, and anybody agree with Jeremy that we want to keep one or incorporate it in some way? No, okay. So I think we're just down to two and three. Um, does everyone agree with the language of two and three? If someone does not agree with the language, please go ahead and propose alternative language. Chris. It sounds like we, it sounds like we all agree that we don't want a recommendation on establishment of a standing committee. It sounds like we all agree that we want an establishment of a standing committee. So I think what we're really after, and I don't have the uh, proposed language, is that they recommend a charge for a standing committee. Um, yeah. Okay, so Penny had suggested assess immediate actions and propose a permanent committee to the council. So what if we say, um, number two, assess immediate actions and propose a permanent committee to the council, including the naming of the standing committee and the charge, period. And we take out the first, pair, the first sentence of two. Madam Chair, could I get you to just fill in after I have Anne there? I'm sorry. Um, I Propose a permanent committee to the council, um, including the naming of the committee and the charge. Thank you so much. Um, Chris. Uh, uh, I still think it's too verbose. I would cut the assess immediate actions and make it uh, straightforward with, uh, and I don't want them to propose the, pro <laughs> and I, I don't mean to quibble, but I, I, it's the, I want you to hand us a ready to go charge that uh, adheres to that based on your kind of assessment and review, and I guess that's what the assess immediate action part is, but I want you to, you committee, to go figure out what you believe the proper charge should be and have it ready for boots on the ground for us to review it and hopefully say, yeah, this looks gr great with almost no changes and then just adopt it. So what I want that I want is that we, we went and got input from stakeholders. Here's the actual charge document for you guys to just review and say, that looks good and then pass. Um, do you have a suggestion on language? 
for that? Give me a second, I'll see if I can. Okay. Um, Short answer is no. And so while, while we think about that, I think it might make sense to look at number three. Um, and we also had a suggestion that we should take out potential from that, which I agree with. Um, and just have racism. Um, but do we need that? Is that included in the charge? I mean, is that something we now envision this committee doing? Or do we just envision this committee bringing us the charge which will include that? Hopefully, I would think that would be at the top of the list. Um, Penny? Yeah, um, I think that um, a couple of things. Number one, um, yes, this is part of the charge because we have the um, immediate actions that need to be taken and they'll be relative to um, racism and inequality. Um, I think it can just say in our, in Cape Elizabeth and, and you can, um, for government, municipal departments, etc. Because there's some really obvious things that can be put out there. The other thing that comes in to these two statements is um, that actively researching and identifying um, uh, work in other communities in our region and across the country. That's going to be important as we identify and we define this committee. We want to draw from what's going on um, around us in, um, in Maine and in uh, other states as well. So I don't know if we assume that people are going to um, infer that or do we need to I explicitly state it that we're assuming you're going to do this I think if there's consensus that that's what we want them to do then we need okay. to explicitly state it I do too I do too exactly because um, we aren't going to define it in a void um, Chris, did you have a response to that or were you? Were you? No, uh, I had proposed language. Um, for, for two? Yeah. Okay. Um, thoughts on Penny's thought on three. Um, who is in support of keeping in, or I guess, does anyone else think that we need to change three in some way? No. Okay. So. Except for taking out potential, correct? Except for taking out potential, which. Okay, good. Is out. Um, okay. So it sounds like people are comfortable leaving three as is. Um, for two, Chris, do you want to take I'll, a stab at language? Yeah, I'm going to say this out loud, so no need to try to capture any of it. Uh, I'm going to say it once through, and if people like this direction, then we would change the words, but don't start typing until after it. So instead of duties of committee at the beginning, changing it to instead committee charge, and then the, instead of the idea committee shall have the following duties, it would be the committee is specifically charged with the following. And then the first would be, to prepare for town council consideration within the first to prepare so to prepare within the first x months uh from the first meeting of the committee for town council consideration a permanent uh committee charge um so that that would be be an attempt to capture it and then also be like we want you guys to do this right now and even setting it as like three months 
that might seem really, really fast, but that's to get it into our hands so that we, because we're so slow, <laughs> that we can get going and then they can be working on three while we're working on what's currently two. And if no one likes that idea, then back to the drawing board, but otherwise I can reiterate all that. Uh, you're on mute. Thank you. Um, I like that idea. <laughs> um, show of hands in favor of Chris's proposal. Penny, Jeremy. Um, sorry, I can't see everyone at once. So Valerie, can't, okay. Okay, so do you wanna reiterate that? And Matt can type it in. Yep, so um, the duties of committee would instead be uh, committee charge. And that's to mirror the committee purpose structure from the, uh, the heading above. It would be the committee, or so civil rights committee, is specifically charged with the following. And this is more the, the ad hoc, like we're giving you this precise task. Um, and then whichever bullets we have would begin with the word two. So uh, number two, skipping one for the time being, just number two would become to prepare, or just a brand new one, to prepare for town council, to prepare within X months from the meeting, from the first meeting of the committee, or the Civil Rights Committee, from the first meeting of the Civil Rights Committee, so we should say which committee we're talking about, um, to prepare within X months from the first meeting of the Civil Rights Committee, uh, a draft, standing committee charge for town council consideration. And then number three, even though we said not change it, you would stick two in front of advise. Since it's now charged with the following to advise the town council. Okay. Um, all, all right, so it sounded like um, item one was coming out. Is that, does anyone disagree with that? Okay, so we'll take item one out. Two becomes one, one, and then, and then we take out everything else below that. That and anyone jump in if it seems like this was not the consensus, but this is what I'm getting. Um, I would, I would say prepare within what six six months and three months jeremy says three months is three months reasonable three months prepare within three months of the first meeting okay um and then in terms of the funding and staff resources needed section um given that this is an ad hoc committee i I don't know anything about this sort of thing. So Valerie, um, you, you drafted this and probably know a whole lot more. Is that still appropriate under the circumstances? No, I don't believe it is because basically what they're doing is um, putting together a standing committee. Uh, this money, we were thinking that they would um, possibly look at training, do some other things. So Matt, um, what are your thoughts on, will they need, um, will they need money or funds to proceed? I don't think so. If I, if I may, Madam Chair, if you're looking at a, at a three month window, uh, it may be wise to, I think you could forego this at this point in time, but as they get organized, 
if there is the uh, need for funding to advance uh, advance the charge, we can always come back. I do have, as you may recall from our budget, we do have funding this year put aside for special uh, special committees, uh, or we could come back and say we are going to need uh, some funding, and uh, I could come back to the council to uh, ask for that at that point in time. Penny. I'm going to say that uh, part of the near term actions might be some uh, training out of the shoot for some of our, um, um, I would say, departments or even the council or um, because what I, I'm going to continue to stress is that it's forming a committee and near term actions. It's there are things that I think we still need to um, can work on. Not that it's a lot, a lot of money, but Matt, if you say that we can say to this ad hoc committee that if they identify a near term action that requires funding, that um, you have the discretion of X amount of dollars, or do you have to come to the council if we don't allocate any dollars here? Well, uh, to they kind of, kind of two different avenues. I know it kind of sounds funny, uh, but uh, on one side, I've got staff development where I may, may uh, you know, that's a whole separate entity. I, I think I could make it work by coming back to the council to say I need uh, X amount of dollars to accomplish that. At this point, to just hang a number is, is it's, it's speculative. Where if I had something, you know, similar to the, uh, the training that we've been availing ourselves of at, uh, through the MMA, with some of the workshops that they've had there uh, lately. Uh, as I know, like that's, that's come out of different training that we've had uh, towards the end of the year. Uh, but if there was something on a larger scale, I would want to come back to the council to, you know, quite honestly, because it's, it's important to the council as well to know that this is the direction we're going at with staff as well as uh, providing the opportunity that the council may want to do. So if I had that, if there's a, uh, for lack of a better term, a fiscal note attached, uh, that said, it's going to be X amount of dollars to do it. I'd want to come and have your blessing uh, there. And I'd have my details lined up uh, so you'd be able to also identify why you'd want to spend it. Okay. Uh, Chris, yes. Penny had her hand up first. Oh, no, it's down. <laughs> okay. Um, just, uh, different topic, but to go up to, if Matt, if you could go to the top paragraph. Yes, sir. I'll be right there. Um, I would suggest that we take the sentence, one town councilor shall serve as a non-voting ex-official member of the committee and up to two student representatives from Cape Elizabeth High School and or Cape Elizabeth School shall serve as non-voting members to be elected or appointed by the school. First of all, I would take that and I would stick it right after the first sentence and I would precede it with the phrase, in addition, to clarify that those individuals are not part of the seven that are uh, appointed, because otherwise it leaves ambiguity as to what we're intending there. Um, and then on top of that, if you look at the uh, two non-voting stu student representatives to the school board, uh, there's this very long drawn out um, detailed process for their appointment um, where they do like, um, there's like a candidate's night at the school and then the school votes and they have to go through this interview process. And it's a very prolonged, uh, process that seemed like it would be applicable here, but at the same time, that's like a year long process that occurs, which doesn't seem applicable here. So instead of having them elected or appointed by the school, I would just have the appointments committee appoint them. Um, I totally see the rationale behind elected or appointed by the school, but because this is, and that would make sense for the permanent one and have them follow a process akin to what these happens for the school board uh, liaisons, but for this, I would just have the appointments committee interview and appoint. Madam Chair, may, may I ask Councilor Straw a, a question as, to, as a follow up on that? Go ahead. Well, possibly for the whole council, quite frankly. Uh, do you think possibly uh, the student representatives may be more appropriate for the standing committee versus the ad hoc committee then at this point, uh, looking at uh, school year uh, organizational capacity? Yes not knowing when the school may happen, things along those lines, and then that may be a larger long-term plan that might work. Jeremy? Sorry, I, um, 
I, I I can see the logic of that. I also am recognizing that we have a lot of young people who've been very active in this space over the last few months and um, providing an opportunity for some of them who may not yet be 18 years of old to have some input into the structure of this permanent committee, I think would be frankly beneficial. Um, okay, hands in favor of keeping in the student representative. Jeremy. Valerie, Jamie, um, Caitlin, is your hand up or? Yes, okay. So we'll keep them in. Um, Thank you. I think that's a good point about the process. Is it, can we just have the appointments committee handle that? Um, all, everyone in favor of just having the appointments committee do that? Okay, looks like pretty much everyone. Um, okay. In, so, in all, for that second sentence also, the suggestion was in addition before the word one. I don't know if, just to help clarify that this is separate from the seven. Uh, right, uh, if, if, Councilor Straw, if you'd indulge me. Uh, yeah, right there, right, right where you got there. Perfect. Okay, <laughs> thank you. So in addition, comma. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, and so where did we land on the, the last part, that funding part, um, in terms of the ad hoc committee? I think we, we got sidetracked as that discussion was sort of wrapping up. Um, so, sorry. Yes, Chris. Uh, uh, did we all just agree that, um, that the appointment was going to be from the regular, uh, Appointments committee for the kid or yes students. Yep. So I think we have to change that language. Shall serve as non-voting members. Um, I think we could end it. And up to two student representatives from Capitalism at the school. Um, up to up to two student representatives appointed by the, uh, oh yeah, yeah, there you go, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So jumping back down to the end there. Um, what do we typically do for an ad hoc committee? Do we? Do we typically have a section like that for an ad hoc committee? Just Valerie. oftentimes funding is is identified as as being part of their part of their construction, and you you, you may be able to make it as simple as saying that. Uh, um, oh shoot! I'm it's getting late. Uh, I'm just trying to think, uh, if you say it as the town manager shall uh, advise the council as to the financial needs of the committee and and return with a recommended funding mechanism or funding balance for the committee to, uh, that as needed. Like type that in so we can see it. And I'll then try that. I think that's. That's probably what's going to work. I want to make sure you know they have what they need. To complete. Would 
would that work? Something along those lines? So then I could come back. At least you'd get a, you had, you would have a ceiling, but then uh, you would know that I, I would come back once they might have identified it. It's similar like the Harbors Committee, I think had, uh, I think they started off with ten thousand uh, dollars to get their their tasks done. That it's it's a guesstimate at this point, quite frankly. Um, Chris, yes. I, I'd strike everything before the first comma, but otherwise, yes. So I just say the town manager will advise the the council on financial needs and request funds as the committee performs its tasks, not to exceed ten thousand. Yeah, I that's I think that sounds great. Um, Quick show of hands, everyone who is in favor of this. All right, looks like, okay. We are all in favor of that. Okay. Um, and then we're going to take out that next part. And um, do we need to, do we leave in the summary? Um, I don't know what's standard for, I think we can. I think we can delete that, Madam Chair. Okay. Valerie, thank you for all of your hard work revising this document. And sorry, we ripped it to pieces. Yes, go ahead. Oh no, this—that was exactly what was intended. This is great. Um, but I just wanted to mention that um, I had just put in here that Matt would. Um, where is it? Matt would staff it or provide staff for the committee. Do we want to decide, Matt, do you want to decide that now or do we leave it that you'll decide who's going to be the, the staff person? If, if, I, if I could, I'd like to come back. Uh, I'm still working that through, but uh, it, it, yeah, uh, if, if I can come back with advice on that. It's either going to be myself. I, I think that's going to be my role, quite frankly. Um, well, also in the purpose, we'll, we have to clean clean that up. Um, you mean clean it up because they're now the charge is now less. Um, I think the first part actually still works, like that first sentence still works because in drafting the charge for the standing committee, they will need to do that. Um, but obviously the, the second part doesn't necessarily work. Um, and the third sentence also doesn't necessarily work. So I think it may just be the first sentence. Does anyone disagree that we may just be down to the first sentence for purpose? No one disagrees. Okay. Um, that looks good. So the one thing that I just want to touch on before we leave this document is um, on the second one, the second point, um, it's a little bit unclear to me what we're actually asking. And I want to make sure it's clear to the committee. Um, so what other than creating the, the standing committee, what are we asking them to do? One thing that I wanted them to do is sort of like an immediate thing is to sort of advise the town council on immediate um, immediate training or education or, you know, essentially I'd like them to provide us with a, a reading list or an, just some some basic first steps that we should take before we even get into looking at the committee. But I don't know if that's what other counselors were envisioning by that number two, and I, I do think it's a little ambiguous. So, um, Valerie, what were you envisioning when you drafted that? Well, this was basically drafted um, by the, the group. We put this all together. 
So um, it's really part of um, the bigger picture. It seems very broad to me. I think that your idea of um, taking action steps and maybe it's um, advising the town council on actions um, the council can take immediately um, and training that can take a, that can happen immediately. Some sort of actions that we can take on right away before the standing committee is put into place. So maybe advise the town council on um, or what Penny's language was assess assess immediate actions. Yeah. So maybe you put assess immediate actions and advise the town council on um, I don't know. Assess assess and assess and advise. Assess and advise. Assess um, immediate actions and advise the town council on, on those issues in order to take action. Okay. Does anyone dislike revised sub two or have any other suggestions? No. Okay. Any other work that any counselor thinks needs to be done on this document? before we move on. This uh, capitalized town council in two. Oh yeah, yeah, cap and, and sub. Or just a consistency between one and two. Right, yeah. either one. Whichever is the right one. It looks like town council elsewhere is lowercase as is town manager, so I think um, that works. Okay, I think we are done. Great. All right. So that is the end of our workshop meeting. Um, we now have our regular meeting. Um, just pulling up the agenda. So how does the how does the vote go? Do we vote now or after we start the meeting? You'll need to uh, to vote to uh, to suspend council rules to take up the actions after after ten o'clock, Madam Chair. So and then, so I think to start the meeting, you'll have to uh, go that route. Okay. So um, I'm I would like to propose just a a two minute break if we are going to proceed. So we'll do the vote first and then that. Um, so all in favor of suspending council rules to take up all items on the agenda um, for our July 20th meeting, special meeting. Um, just show of hands. I think we need a roll call. Oh, right, we need a roll call. Sorry, I forgot about that. Do you have a motion and a second? I move that we suspend the rules to take up the items on our special meeting tonight. Second. Jeremy, second. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Garvin? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. Chairman Adams? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Um, so just quick two minute break and then we'll convene the meeting and plow right through.
Okay, so we are all back. Um, we already convened this meeting earlier before breaking to take up the workshop. Um, and um, do we need to redo, well, we need to do the roll call for this one. De Deborah, while, uh, while you were out earlier uh, with the internet, I, I did do a full roll call and we did do the Pledge of Allegiance at the, uh, at the beginning. So we're good. Okay, <laughs> great. Um, so there are 15 attendees left with us this evening. Thank you for your devotion. Um, does anyone have an item uh, not on this evening's agenda that they would like to raise? This is your opportunity. Seeing no one. Okay. Um, item number 102-2020, recommendation from the Energy Committee relating to a landfill solar project. Um, Anyone here wishing to comment on this particular item, please go ahead and raise your hand if so. All right, seeing no one. Um, so we do have some information in the materials this evening. Um, and we are now Finally, um, looking to authorize the manager to enter into negotiations with Encore Renewable Energy for the installation of a solar power installation at the Cape Elizabeth Recycling Center, um, former landfill site, which is recommended by the Energy Committee. And I first want to thank the Energy Committee for their work and getting this together because um, it's been a long time coming and we are very much appreciative of all of your hard work. Um, all right, so is there a motion to authorize the manager to enter into negotiations. Oh, um, Jeremy, thank you. Is there a second? Second. Uh, Chris? Um, discussion on this particular item? Penny? Um, I just wanted to know if uh, we're going to address the questions that Bill Downs put forward. I, I think we should at least acknowledge them and address them um, specifically about not any supporting documents. Um, I, I know that they have had their minutes and their research because I think we have seen that before. Actually, I shouldn't say I think, I know. Um, and um, Question two about no usage and cost history for the town. I thought we had seen um, we had seen that. Um, so I'm hoping we can address those questions. Yeah, I, 
I just I don't, want them to follow, I don't want them to follow us through this whole process. Um, yeah, I just I'm seeing that email. Um, and I also, Jamie, did you have a response to that or something else? I was going to bring up the same point because um, I think we have all the information. I guess I'm just questioning whether or not it's not been posted or um, so. Chris? Uh, yeah, I think it's, it's not part of tonight's packet, but over the last two, three years. Um, so the, de the usage analysis that was, that began with the ad hoc committee. It was like 2016, I could have the year wrong. Uh, but we've been analyzing that for a, a while. Um, it's a good point that, hey, have you actually looked at what your usage was? But this is something that we, it's not part of tonight's packet, but something that has been looked at. With respect to uh, where's the details of the plan, we already had the various bids come in previously. And then we said, hey, guys, uh, go get more for, for the, and prepare for the final negotiator. With it. And that's how we ended up at this point. So. Other stuff has been in prior meetings. Tonight's packet doesn't include those prior meetings things that we've seen, is my recollection. Yeah, and they did put together a, a very, the, the ad hoc committee put together a very comprehensive document. Um, and I think a lot of this information was in that document. But I would agree that we've seen a lot of this stuff. Jeremy? And, and also just for the record, I note um, that Bill asked a question about the capacity factor um, and why the um, energy committee bids showed a such high, such a high range. I just note that the recommended um, bid proposal from the energy committee is within that, or well, not within, but it's closer to that range of 14 and a half to 16 and a half percent um, for our, for the ISO New England um, solar study, it's uh, and is on the lowest. It's actually the lowest of of any of the bids that were submitted. Valerie, um, I could not get either of the links to work um, to the Energy Committee draft minutes or the uh, meeting materials. But with that, um, my concern is that the energy committee put together a short list with four bids. Um, isn't the town manager supposed to review those bids with, with an attorney? Is that something that, um, it just seems like this is a 20 year contract and we have four bids. Isn't the town manager reviewing all four of them before um, taking up the recommendation? And I appreciate the recommendation and all the work they've done. But um, they aren't um, elected or hired by the town. So I would think that, isn't it? Maybe I don't know the process, but I feel like it's my due diligence to ask the question, at least since um, we are elected and this is a 20 year contract. Yeah. Matt, did you have a response to that? A, cu a couple of different areas, if I may, Madam Chair. Uh, first, we do have Sam Milton and Sam Lipman and a couple of other members from the, Ener the Energy Committee who are here tonight as attendees and have, have, uh, have stuck it out to this point. Um, the co council received back in our workshop on June 1st an analysis of all the uh, supplied materials that they had received up till that point and their ranking of the different uh, uh, proposed vendors uh, to do that, as well as uh, they had a significantly uh, or substantial uh, RFP that was sent out to all of them that qualified a lot of that within their responses uh, to help them to get to that point. Uh, so they have, uh, they have reviewed and went back after the council workshop in June uh, to look back and have a conversation with, all, uh, with the top three and then they added on a, the, the fourth next bidder, uh, reviewed all their proposals as well. And then, uh, and then came back and asked them for their last best offer. And that's uh, why they came forward with their, their recommendation. Um, that's, that's generally been the practice with many uh, of the committees in the past. Uh, Energy Committee uh, has followed the same pattern as, uh, say, last, last week, the Fort Williams Advisory Committee, or Fort Williams Park Committee, sorry, uh, old habit. Uh, <laughs> Fort Williams Park Committee came forward with their recommendation uh, regarding the master plan update. Uh, prior to that, uh, the uh, recycling committee had come forward with their recommendation 
uh, that they had for that for that project. And uh, I'm trying to think others that had taken place in the past uh, for recommendations to the council. At, at this point, it's to enter into negotiations with the uh, committee. Uh, sorry, with the uh, with the entity that they recommended. So uh, ultimately, it comes down to any any steps from this point forward. Also, come back to the council to approve as well what the final uh, details would be. But it, it may be a good opportunity at this point to ask uh, Mr. Milton to uh, also provide anything that I, I may have just missed as well as some of the discussions from the committee, if that would be helpful. Um, Mr. Milton, you are permitted to talk. Good evening, how are you everybody? Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, um, Councilors and uh, Town staff. Uh, yes, as Chair of the Energy Committee, um, I can attest that we've spent the last few months um, kind of very diligently going through the uh, various bids we've received and creating um, a, a, a fairly complicated and, and complex scoring matrix. Not that it's complicated, but it's 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 comprehensive. Um, kind of looking at the various bids across all sorts of different um, different metrics. Um, and yeah, now as, as a town manager, um, Sir just said, um, you've, you've kind of gone through um, all of those and the cream of the crop has risen to the top. Um, and that's the, the company that we recommend the town interest in good nations and Zoom. Um, and that we're here to support that process as much as, um, as, much as we can. Um, and, uh, you know, are willing and able to answer any questions about the process, about the information, and technical matters, um, and about the contract structure. Um, and um, yeah, as Council Straw, Straw has mentioned, um, this is a this has been a project that the the, the town has been kind of eyeing for for years now. Um, so I'm proud to finally shepherd this through this one of these you know final stages where we can actually um, get the facility developed. Thank you. Additionally, if I may, Madam Chair, uh, on the on the on the town council packets uh, link uh, uh, for this evening's meeting. There was the Energy Committee meeting distribution slides from July 16th, 2020, uh, that was provided there, and that did show the uh, our, our annual usage at uh, 2,151,027 kilowatt hours in 2019. So that that information was uh, was there as well, and that showed, you know, even with uh, the annual production from the uh, you know from the selected vendor. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll help us meet, but we will not exceed, or that doesn't even exceed the, the annual usage that we do have. So that information was also available. I don't know if Mr. Downs didn't see that or uh, I can't. But. Yeah, it looks like the link in the agenda didn't work, but the document was in the supporting documents on the website and that link works. So um, I, I'm, I don't know if he's in attendance, I don't, it doesn't look like it, but I, I'm happy to email him and just follow up on that. Um, and it looks like uh, Richard Parker, who's also on the committee, is has a hand up. So I'd like to give him an opportunity to speak. And Richard, your microphone should be live, but you just would need to unmute it. Okay. <clears throat> yes, um, I just wanted to, um, um, Matt just mentioned about what the capacity was, and I also ought to add to that that you know we're, we're we would only support we'd only want to supply eighty percent of our usage because you get a if you exceed your annual usage you don't get reimbursed for it so you need to stay below your annual usage. The other thing I'd like to mention when he talks about um, the um, uh, number of quotes and options uh, when we put the request for bid out uh, we had seven companies reply. And in total, that we had 31 different options between the seven country companies that we that we uh, had to evaluate, and those were um, with discussions with the town council and with discussion with the workshop. Those were narrowed down to uh, four companies, and uh, with the instructions we uh, relative to whether or not the companies con the, the town council wanted to keep the recs or not, uh, we narrowed it down to the to the final nine options that you see in the in the uh, information that we sent tonight. Um, and you, you notice that they, 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 it was close and the final recommendation from the council or from the committee was based on not only the, the, uh, the, the qualitative stuff we did, but also the quantitative stuff we did, but also the more subjective things. 
you know, we, we see that the ratings between HEP, Amorisco, Encore, and Nexrid are in many ways very close, but it was uh, our, the, the, the committee's uh, uh, strong feeling that Encore was the one that was best to, uh, to meet the overall objectives of the town. And, uh, you know, they've got a, a vested interest in, uh, in, uh, in Maine, and uh, they're very serious about expanding their market, so I think they're going to be uh, a good vendor. The other thing I'd mentioned is that the committee has some expertise on negotiating these types of uh, contracts. And so uh, if uh, in the process of negotiating the final contract, if you want to utilize some of those resources, uh, those are more than, uh, you're more than welcome and they'll be readily available to you. Um, thank you, Richard. And thanks for sticking it out and helping out this evening. Um, okay. Does anyone else have any questions for the members of the committee who are here? Any, Chris? It wasn't a question. I was just going to know. Uh, yeah, so I think you get, as you touched on, it was the June workshop that we got a, a pretty detailed presentation from the Energy Committee on all of this. And they described for us uh, the various RFPs. That was what I was recalling with us reviewing the RFPs, because I don't think we looked at the details of this particular ones. But uh, with respect to the materials tonight, I just wanted to highlight the fact that uh, the Encore 1, so my understanding is, is we're looking at the Encore 1, not the Encore 3. Um, uh, committee, correct me if I'm wrong about that. But the estimate was a net present value of savings to the town over the next 20 years. Right now, of estimate was about $900,000. So this is a, uh, a, a proposal that our estimates, which hopefully are roughly accurate, is this is going to save the taxpayers $900,000 in debt value as of net present value. Thanks, Chris. Um, okay, and Valerie, I definitely appreciate you bringing up that point. I think you're right. It is, it is our duty as public officials to ask the question. So um, if we are all satisfied, did you have something else to add? I just wanted to ask, um, if Matt did receive all four bids and there, he, he had, you do have yes. them. Yeah, okay. I've, been, I've been able to see all the documents and, and I've been meeting with, uh, uh, often every other Tuesday or so with, uh, with the chairman and the, and, and the, another representative from the committee as well. They've been trying to, since the last council uh, workshop, we've been trying to keep uh, up to speed on that on a week to week basis. So. Uh, yeah, they've done they've done an incredible job, and the bandwidth in that committee is uh, nothing short of amazing. So they've done a great job. And the last part is, I will. Uh, I mean, it says authorize the manager to enter into negotiations, but I will be hiring uh, legal services to uh, who, who are familiar and speak the language to to assist through that process. To when we come back to council to have it teed up properly. Go ahead. Right. And I just want to finish up by thanking the committee for all of the work they've done. I know that um, it's been a long drawn out process and we really appreciate all of the work, all the presentations you've given us and getting us to this point. Thank you so much. And thank you for staying <laughs> with us until 11 o'clock at night. This, thank you. Okay. So if there's no further discussion, um, we'll take a vote on the motion on the table. You're, you're muted, Deb. Sorry, I hit it, it's not good enough. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Garvin? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councillor Straw? Yes. Chairman Adams? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Um, next item, item 103-2020, short-term rental ordinance. Okay. After our extensive workshopping of the ordinance, um, do I have a motion to forward the proposed amendments as, as amended this evening um, to the zoning or uh, 
to the zoning the to the, the planning, planning board, board. Uh, yes planning. proposed so amendments moved. to the zoning ordinance relating to short-term rentals to the planning board for review so moved Caitlin. second second, second. okay any discussion oh i'm sorry i i missed the uh the public comment on this item before we delve into it and thank you jamie for reminding me um any any public comment on the item no doesn't look like it okay um so any any further discussion from the council on this item no all right all in favor um deb Councilor devereaux yes Councilor gabrielson yes Councilor garvin yes Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? No. Chairman Adams? No. Motion carries five yay, two nay. Thank you. Um, all right, item, dash, item 104 2020, the Appointments Committee recommendation relating to um what is now the civil rights committee an ad hoc committee any further public comment on this item before we vote all right um uh -oh. i'm frozen can you still hear me mm -hmm. okay um all right so we're looking for a motion to approve the recommendation um, of the appointments committee as revised this evening um, to create an ad hoc civil rights committee reporting back to the council within three months. Um, Valerie, are you, is that your motion? Yes, so moved. Okay, is there a second? Second. Thank you, Penny. <laughs> All right, any discussion on this item? All in favor. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Garvin? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. Chairman Adams? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Um, item 105-2020, confirmation of the appointment of a public works director. Thank you, Matt, for your email, um, all the information. Huge thanks to Bob Malley for all of his work. Um, and also thank you to Jay Reynolds for um, putting himself out there and, and being ready to take on the mantle of leadership after Bob, which is um, definitely big shoes to fill, but I'm sure that it sounds like we picked a great candidate. So um, is there any public comment on this agenda item? Does not look like it. All right, looking for a motion to confirm the recommendation of the town manager. Um, Jamie, are you making a yes. motion? I uh, was, but more second, whatever you need. Okay. so. Uh, Jamie's motion to confirm the recommendation of the hiring of Jay Reynolds as Director of Public Works, effective August 10th, 2020. Is there a second? Jeremy, second. thank you. Uh, and any discussion? Chris? Just say, to, uh, since it looks like Mr. Reynolds is online, thank you for putting up with the late hour of the meeting. And hopefully this is the last time in a long time. We're up to 11.10. <laughs> Until tax season. Yeah. <laughs> All right, sorry, budget season. Um, yes, Matt. Sorry, I uh, apologize for that. If I may just uh, briefly, I just wanted to say this is an exceptional candidate and we are overjoyed to have Jay come on board with us. Jeremy uh, Gabrielson, uh, Councilor Gabrielson was in on the hiring committee, uh, went through two different rounds. Jay shown through uh, spectacularly both sides and uh, to get him to join our team, a uh, caliber of what he brings is gonna be just an outstanding asset for the team and we are so happy to have him come on board. So uh, August 10th is what we're looking at for a beginning date and uh, uh, 
just oh, couldn't be happier. Sad to, leave, sad to lose Bob, but at the same time, extremely happy for him and uh, graduating to uh, his next chapter. But we are also equally now very happy to have Jay come on board. Yes. Um, and thank you, Jay, for sticking it out to this 11 11. Um, okay, so all in favor? Councillor Devereaux? Yes. Councillor Gabrielson? Yes. Councillor Garvin? Yes. Councillor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councillor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councillor Straw? Yes. Chairman Adams? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. All right. <laughs> um, item 106-2020, relocation of the War Veterans Monument. Um, any one from the public wishing to comment on this particular item? Does not appear so. Um, okay, so it's recommended by the Planning Board approval to install a flagpole and relocate the War Veterans Monument um, to the Village Green. So we're looking for a motion to authorize the relocation of the War Veterans Monument to the Green. So moved. Valerie, thank you. Is there a second? Second. Penny, um, discussion on this item? Jeremy? Sorry, I don't mean to open up a can of worms at this hour of night, but I'm just curious um, what the legal status of the land sitting under the, mo under the monument is going to be. Um, will the town be granted an easement um, and, or will the, will the green be granted in fee to the town? It, if I may, Madam Chair, uh, yes, the town, uh, when, they, when they finally get that to the point that it uh, meets the uh, site plan approvals, uh, you should anticipate seeing at some point in the future uh, deeding it to the town as part of the approval. That, so they'll be giving that land to the town with all the improvements. So ultimately, it will be a town asset uh, and under our ownership. Thank you. I, I'm comfortable voting for that then. And uh, you will you will see on next month's agenda as well. Uh, a thank you to uh, some local citizens who donated additional funds uh, to upgrade uh, significantly the the flagpole that shall be going there as well. So there's been uh, we have some very generous people who wanted to help out, and uh, specifically that's uh, what they'll be doing. So a preview of coming attractions for that as well. Thanks, Matt. Um, Jamie, go ahead. I just had a question. Is there any updated um, sort of design plan uh, reflective of what, you know, now that we're a little further into the actual work? I, I, I remember early on looking at, you know, some of the things that we reviewed. and I, I just didn't know if there was anything more current reflective of, of um, what the work is. And, and sort of related to that, is there anything else that's planned to be cited there? Um, you know, I know, like, for example, the Joni statue is adjacent to the War Memorial, but I, I, I don't know if there are plans to move that, or is, is this intended to become sort of the new location for a lot of that stuff, or? Looking at it to be the new location for uh, for the majority of the, uh, like for, for Memorial Day, I think the plan, and we have power run there now as well, so they'll be able to have amplification uh, to host, uh, you know, the ceremonies after uh, Memorial Day Parade. Uh, with the war memorial there and we can uh, dress that up uh, we are looking at dr jacobson's office which is uh, they're doing a lot of the site work back there the other remaining lots have are still available and on the market uh, but nothing's come forward at least to, to fill those uh, but uh, i know watching it take shape over the past uh, you know really the past four weeks and to seeing the grass is growing in the plantings are all going into place uh, you know the site plan is you know, we've looked at that a couple different times. They they pretty much have carried that true to form as to what was approved. So uh, it's a significant improvement right there, and just waiting to see the um, you know the rest of it, rest of the lots get populated eventually. But Dr. Jacobson's office should be uh, doing their construction yeah. in the near term. I, I meant more just the green and the oh. elements on the green. Like I remember what we looked at was you know a landscape design rendering. That I, I, I was talking about more about the specific elements for the park. But. Sure. No, that's yeah. uh, that, was, that was what was originally brought to the council, uh, right down to the exact trees that have been planted, 
And uh, the, the only wrinkle that we did have was the drainage that uh, was brought back to the council when we found that uh, we had drainage going off to the site, but everything else there has, uh, has fallen true to form as to what was, what was brought to council originally. Um, any other questions or comments? Okay, um, all in favor. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Garvin? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. Chairman Adams? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you, Deb. Um, okay, so there are just a few attendees left. So if anyone has a top, would like to raise any topic not on the agenda this evening, this is your opportunity. Um, Paul. Hi, I just wanted to mention Chris. I hope you're in Fiji because it's only 3.15 in the afternoon there. <laughs> I wanted to give a shout out to Penny and Valerie D. Thanks, Caitlin, Jeremy. Jamie, Matt, Deborah, and Valerie A, um, how you managed to be frozen for even a moment on a night like tonight, I just don't know, but it's pretty amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for sticking with us till 1117. <laughs> yeah. Madam Chair, if I just said one, one last thing, uh, I hope like heck not to bother you uh, until August 10th. If, uh, if that provides any solace for the hard work that the council did this evening, I thank you for all of your efforts. It's a, it was a heavy lift tonight and you guys did awesome. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, thank, thanks everyone for sticking it out. And um, we're looking for a motion to adjourn. Good. So second. So much. <laughs> second. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, all in favor. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Garvin? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? I'm not quite sure yet. I've been having too much fun. <laughs> okay, yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. Chairman Adams? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Thanks. Good night, everyone. Y'all take care. Sleep well. <laughs>